Thank you so much, Alex. And I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your week to join us for this exciting meeting. And Alex, if you could start my slides, please. So um, this is the first public meeting of the current generation of the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team. We are a four year NASA funded effort by the Applied Sciences Program to make NASA data, science, and tools more relevant to stakeholders in the health and air quality communities. So we often say our mission is to bring the power of NASA down to earth and into your hands. Next slide, please. When we talk about NASA data and tools, this is a wide suite of um, instruments, measurements, models, but the backbone of these capabilities um, is the uh, suite of instruments uh, up in space that detect, uh, that detect uh, chemicals in the air and characteristics of surface. These satellite data products um, have been up in orbit for decades, um, but the science has evolved to the point that they're becoming more and more useful for kind of operational real world applications. And that really the bridge between these data and tools and different sorts of applied problems is really what our team is intended to do. Next slide, please. So just so that, you know, we'll be talking about our team HACAST as we pronounce the funny acronym. Um, this is a NASA funded applied science team. There are 14 members. Each member works with a series of co-investigators. So all total, there's more than 70 funded researchers involved. And, uh, and this is um, the folks, the 14 members were selected by a competitive proposal process um, where proposals were submitted to the NASA Applied Sciences team and selected. Uh, we just found out, I think, late December, and this is our first public meeting. Um, there are three types of projects that our team advances. The projects that members proposed in their applications, as well as TIGER teams. These are short-term um, uh, projects that are collaborative across our team, as well as outreach engagement and rapid response uh, that I work with a group at the University of Wisconsin and part of our leadership role. Next slide, please. Um, this is the third generation of this initiative. The first uh, team that we call HACAST-1 uh, was at the time called ACAST, the Air Quality Applied Sciences Team. Um, then we had the first generation of HACAST, which we call HACAST-2, which ran from 2016 to 2020. And this current generation runs for the, this year through 2025. The goal of a team is to really have a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts, um, increasing the visibility of these resources to end users, building two-way dialogue, and um, using collaborations to solve problems that no one individual researcher may be able to solve on their own. Next slide. The timeline here extends through 2025, and really then there's these two tracks. There's the projects that HACAST members have proposed, and you'll be hearing about those today. But there's also a new initiative called Tiger Teams, and these are projects that haven't formed yet and that will be forming in part based on feedback from you through this meeting um, and through other platforms that we have available. Um, so these Tiger Teams are projects that haven't even gotten launched yet, and we're really looking forward to hearing from stakeholders through this meeting to um, hear what the priorities should be for these collaborative efforts. Next slide. So uh, much of this is what Alex uh, mentioned, but our website, heycast.org, has lots of information, including for this meeting, where there's um, the breakout rooms that we'll be uh, launching into later. These are actually already open. So if uh, you want to go over there with any colleagues, you can point and mention in the chat that you'll be going into one of the breakout rooms and kind of like as if we were at a real um, conference center, you can have a one-off conversation um, even, even before the formal breakout sessions. Next slide, please. And finally, I'd just like to, uh, I'll post this link in the chat, but we have a um, Google Doc to assemble ideas from organizations. So as you're listening to the talks today, as you're getting ideas of what would be a cool thing for your organization, 
this is one of the many ways that we're trying to collect your ideas. So I'll post that in the chat as soon as I stop speaking. I'd encourage you to look at it, see what ideas are already there, and think what would be helpful to your organization. Next slide. And there's, I'll hand it off to our program manager, Dr. John Haynes. Well, hi, thanks, Tracy, and welcome everybody to HACAS Launch 21. I'm John Haynes, Program Manager of Health and Air Quality Applications, part of the Earth Science Division at NASA headquarters in DC. And I just want to give a very brief overview of applied sciences and the Health and Air Quality Applications program in particular to show you the umbrella on when, under which HACAST falls here at NASA. So let's go to the next slide. And as Tracy mentioned just a moment ago, it really all begins here in NASA Earth Science, several hundred kilometers above our head in low Earth orbit with our constellation of over 20 satellites and sensors continuously monitoring Earth's weather, climate, and environment for research and applications purposes. This constellation of satellites and sensors, including several on the continuously crewed International Space Station, represent the largest civilian Earth observing constellation in the world and also represent an investment of approximately two billion, that's billion with a B, US dollars per year by the American taxpayer. This constellation would not be possible without, without all of the domestic and international partners uh, indicated on the slide via their logos or their national flags. Let's go to the next slide. So literally every day, terabytes, tens of terabytes of data are downloaded from this constellation of satellites to the ground, all of this data and observations showing how the Earth system is continuously and dynamically changing. Now, many of these observations are critical for health and air quality applications, such as aerosols, land temperature, fires and thermal anomalies, just to name a few. And if we can click again, Alex, the great news about all of this data is that it's all free and open access to everyone in the globe, all through earthdata.nasa.gov. It's already been paid for and there to be utilized by researchers, end users, and stakeholders, both domestically and internationally. Let's go to the next slide. So where we sit is the NASA Applied Sciences Program. Our mission is to discover and demonstrate innovative and practical uses of Earth observations in organizations' policy, business, and management decisions. And we do this at all levels, including at the local level, state, regional level, national level with the federal government as, and also regional consortiums, as well as with international organizations and NGOs. We also work very closely with the private sector. We have three lines of business in applied sciences applications where uh, we periodically uh, solicit for open peer review proposals uh, to prove out, develop, and transition applications ideas for sustained uses of Earth observations and decision making. And that includes team solicitations like ACAS. In fact, we have a new solicitation on the street currently for three-year end-to-end PI-led projects, which I'll put a link into the chat box later where that solicitation is located. Um, and proposals are due in June of this year. We also have a capacity building line of business, which I'll touch on in a minute, and also a mission planning line of business where we uh, work very closely and identify applications early in mission life cycle. So we are making sure that once new, uh, new satellites and sensors get on orbit, we're getting the most bang for the buck as quickly as possible uh, via applications um, from those satellites and sensors. And I'll touch on a couple of those later as well. Let's go to the next slide. So in the Applied Sciences Program at NASA, there are five areas of emphasis, including agriculture, ecological forecasting, disaster management and water resources, and of course, most importantly to us all, health and air quality applications. Let's go to the next slide. So why health and air quality? Um, and I'm very proud to say that health and air quality has been a focus area of NASA Applied Sciences since its start two decades ago. Number one reason is because of the potential health effects of climate variability and change. As we all know, uh, certainly the effects of climate change have uh, uh, wide ranging effects on air pollution levels, contamination pathways, transmission dynamics with a wide impact on environmental health as well. Let's go to the next slide. There's also the issue of global emerging and re-emerging infectious and infect vector-borne diseases, a topic uh, no more at the forefront than over the past year with the COVID-19 global pandemic. Now, while this topic is not a focus area of HACAST, it is a focus area for many projects in the broader health and air quality applications portfolio. Because keep in mind, there's almost 30 projects currently in the portfolio, including the HACAST team. Let's go to the next slide. 
This infographic from the World Health Organization kind of says it all. The air pollution is the silent killer. Every year, around 7 million excess deaths are incurred worldwide due to exposure from both outdoor and household air pollution with the, of course, issues of cardiovascular disease, strokes, heart attacks, as well as issues of respiratory diseases, including COPD and lung cancer. Let's go to the next slide. And we always want to keep in mind the paradigm of One Health. Uh, this is the One Health definition promulgated by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that does serve a, as a touchstone for not only our program, but many other federal agencies involved in the health sector, emphasizing the collaborative, multi-sectoral, and transdisciplinary approach that certainly HACAST is taking part in to work at all levels with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes, recognizing the uh, strong interconnection between people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. Let's go to the next slide. So this is the mission of the Health and Air Quality Program at NASA, supporting the use of Earth observations and air quality management in public health regarding infectious disease and environmental health issues, the implementation of air quality standards, policies, and regulations for economic and human welfare, and addressing the effects of climate change on public health and air quality to support managers and policymakers in their planning and preparations in the years and decades to come. You can see some major partners listed at the bottom. That is certainly far from an exhaustive list, but just an example of the different sectors and partners that we work with in the portfolio. Let's go to the next slide. I did want to touch on a very important piece of NASA's Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program, and that is the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, known as RSAT, led by Dr. Anna Pradas of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. RSAT works hand in, in glove with NASA HACAS in order to develop a capacity building training exercises and presentations that before COVID were not only in person, but also virtual, course right now, always virtual. And these are hands-on guided computer exercises about how to access, interpret, and knowledgeably use NASA satellite images for decision support. I encourage you to look, take a look at their website where it has a plethora of online trainings and case studies. And again, uh, many members of HACAST work directly with RSET in order to build the capacity to use NASA data and tools in the wider community. Let's go to the next slide. As I mentioned, we're very involved in future mission planning. We have a amazing, robust constellation of Earth observing satellites, but we're always looking to push the research and applications envelope with new innovative technologies to be launched to orbit. And we have two very important satellites that are gonna be launched in the near future for the health and air quality applications program. One is TEMPO which will be in geostationary orbit and will continuously every hour of the day monitor the air we breathe, including looking at atmospheric constituents such as ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and formaldehyde. It will form a global northern hemispheric constellation with our partners in Korea and Europe as well. Tempo will be launched in 2022, and we can go to the next slide because also in 2022, we will be launching the MAYA satellite. MAYA stands for the Multi-Angle Imager for Aerosols, and it represents the first time that NASA, <clears throat> excuse me, it represents the first time that NASA has ever partnered with epidemiologists and health organizations to use space-based data to study human health and improve lives. MIA will be in low Earth orbit and will be directly targeting megacities across the globe to measure particulate matter across those megacities and then correlate it with epidemiolo epidemiological studies for adverse birth outcomes, cardiovascular and respiratory disease, and premature deaths. The Maya mission is led by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and is again expected to be launched next year as well. So both of these instruments will be uh, very important, particularly in the latter half of HACAS, but already the early adopter teams for both of these missions are working with synthetic data sets and getting prepared uh, to use the, the real data the moment these missions go to orbit. And the last slide is my last slide. It's just, again, thank you so much for being here. I am extremely excited about the new HACAST team and its four-year mission. I can't wait to get started. If you'd like more information, not only on health and air quality at NASA, but the entire Applied Sciences program, I encourage you to visit our website at appliedsciences.nasa.gov. And I'll turn it back over to Tracy. Thank you, John. And, you know, I'll just, uh, that's a great overview. And I'll encourage folks to type any questions for John in the chat. And John, maybe you can answer them in the chat. We don't have any questions. Oh, there is one question. Um, can you speak to the Biden administration interest in air quality and health differences due to economic disparities? And will that be a future interest area? 
Uh, yes, and, and there, as many of you have been aware of, uh, if you've been uh, tuned into the news at any time of the past month and a half, there's been a flurry of executive orders and, and directives from the new administration on many issues related to public health and air quality and climate change as well, including on the issue of economic disparities and on uh, environmental justice issues. And that is certainly an emphasis area that we're looking at. Uh, one of the members of the HayCast team has already been doing an amazing work looking at these types of issues, uh, particularly with particular matter 2.5 in, in urban areas. That's Susan Annenberg at George Washington University and her uh, colleague, Dan Goldberg. Um, so we already have expertise here on HayCast to start addressing those issues. And uh, I'll say more to come on that as far as uh, potentially um, don't want to say too much, but there's potentially uh, possibly some future budget capacity that we may have uh, from the new administration to be able to further look at these ideas and this issue. Uh, obviously, extremely, extremely important and looking forward to that. Great. Well, thank you so much, John. And, and you can keep asking John questions and he can respond in the chat. But for now, let's move on to our first panel. And um, Alex, if you could queue up those slides. Sure. All right, so that was amazing. Uh, this first session here is uh, new applications for satellite data, and that's going to have three speakers here. Um, you met her before, Dr. Tracy Holloway from UW-Madison, the team lead, as well as Dr. Brian Duncan from NASA Goddard. And finally, Catherine Pruitt from the American Lung Association. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Tracy, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Alex, and thanks, everyone. Um, you heard me talk a few minutes ago about the team in general, and it's really just such an honor to be the lead for the team. Next slide, please. Um, but then I'll be talking today about the uh, now about the work that I'll be doing as a member of the team, uh, what I proposed in terms of my personal work with stakeholder partners. And the big picture goal of my personal uh, group's uh, research effort, as well as um, my kind of mission leading the team, is really to broaden the use of satellite data for health and air quality management. Next slide, Alex. So um, it's really an honor to be working with an amazing group of co-investigators and collaborators. Um, at the University of Wisconsin, I'm working with Dr. Jonathan Patz, who directs the Global Health Institute, Dr. Brad Pierce, who directs our um, Space Sciences Engineering Center, SSEC, and actually uh, uh, the University of Wisconsin is often uh, referred to as the birthplace of satellite meteorology. So it's really an exciting place to be uh, working on these issues related to air quality and satellites, among other NASA tools. Um, um, one of our co-investigators is Ana Prados, who directs the NASA Applied Remote Sensing and Training Program that um, John mentioned earlier. And that's been a major uh, bridge between stakeholder communities and NASA. And so really thrilled to be working with Ana on this. Um, among our uh, collaborators are uh, Baron Henderson and Kirk Baker from EPA. And Baron will be speaking in our last session today. Um, Diana Van Bleep, but also many others from the American Lung Association. And I'm thrilled to have Catherine Pruitt, who's gonna be speaking in just a few minutes as part of this session. Um, Brady Seals from the Rocky Mountain Institute and Greg Yarwood from Ramble. Next slide, please. We have different projects that um, we're working with these different groups on, but they're all trying to think about what is the way to use satellite data to address questions of relevance to these audiences. And our work with the American Lung Association is building on a paper that was published and kind of a broader set of conversations that's been emerging in our work with stakeholders for a long time, which is basically that from a health perspective, one of the most desirable uh, data sets that can come from satellites is estimates of near surface fine particulate matter. But um, one of the challenges is that satellites don't see near surface fine particulate matter. It has to be estimated using various data fusion approaches. And I often describe this data fusion process kind of like baking a cake because it matters, first of all, what recipe you use and what ingredients, what specific data products from satellites do you use, what models do you use? What monitors do you use? And how do you combine them together? And we did an analysis with four different data sets. These are all for 2011, so a little bit older. But you can see that the results that you get from different combinations used in different ways uh, really 
really affects the outcome. And so one of the projects I'll be doing with the American Lung Association is to compare these different data products in regions of interest. Next slide. So I'll end here just saying that, you know, my partners on this project are a small subset of the wider umbrella of Haycast, and we are really trying to reach all sorts of NASA data users. So I'll end there and hand it over to my colleague, Brian Duncan. Hello. Uh, okay, my Haycast project title is entitled Integrating NASA Resources into the Standard Operating Procedures of Air Quality Agency in Low and Moderate Income countries, LMICs. Next slide. And this, and the motivation for my Haycast project was an American Thoracic Society workshop held in May of 2017. Uh, and in this, I was a co-lead with Kevin Cromer of NYU, who's also on my Haycast team. And the idea was to bring together people with expertise in various air quality data sets, including satell from satellites, uh, global forecasts, uh, low cost sensors, regulatory monitors, and so on. And there were two recommendations of the many given in the report that really resonated with me. One is that we, is to develop an integrated approach to air pollution monitoring, uh, to take advantage of the temporal and spatial scales, the, the information you get from these various sources, uh, and also the potential power of these non-regulatory data for the LMIC. Next slide. So this, Schematic represents uh, the City AQ initiative, which began or well was conceived in May of 2019, uh, and part of it's uh, being completed. And my HACAS proposal expands upon this initiative. So if you look on the left uh, uh, column first, uh, these activities are nearing completion for our pilot cities. Uh, so we are. Uh, have brought in the NASA air quality forecast system uh, to them. So the heavy lifters on this were uh, the Global Model Modeling and Assimilation Office, GMAO at NASA, and the World Resource Institute. They, are developed, they developed uh, web resources, apps, and so on. And also out of the GMAO, Christoph Keller, who's also on my proposed uh, ACAS team, uh, developed a machine learning technique that can downscale or tailor the forecast to individual air quality monitors. Uh, all and this is for any city around the world. And only a, a city only has to upload their quality monitor data to the OpenAQ database. And this information, these tailored forecasts and forecasts go to into the partner's decision making. And our pilot cities are listed here. Uh, there are currently seven. Uh, six are in Latin America, such as Quito, Rio de Janeiro, and Guadalajara, and one in Africa, Kigali, Rwanda. Okay, for the new HACAS, or the expanded aspect of the City AQ initiative, uh, is to bring in satellite data and low cost sensors, uh, if the city wishes to do that. And there's a strong capacity building component to the new HACAS activities here. Uh, and one other component is uh, Kevin Cromer of NYU has experience with uh, forecasting, uh, messaging the forecast and issuing alerts. He's worked with Mexico City and he will do this with uh, one or more cities uh, in our pilot study. Next slide. So here, here are the members of uh, the HACAS team. Uh, there's myself and Dan Anderson, a postdoc. Uh, from the Global Modeling and Assimilati Assimilation Office, there's Christoph Keller and Emma Nolan. They are the brains and the bronze of the uh, air quality forecast system from NASA. Uh, Anna Prados, who's uh, Tracy and John have both mentioned it's on my team and it's excellent she's on my team because six of the seven cities that we are working with are in Latin America and she speaks Spanish and she also has experience working with uh, Latin American stakeholders. Uh, Kevin Cromer of NYU who I already mentioned, uh, Jessica Seddon and Beatrice Cardenas of the World, uh, World Resources Institute are our stakeholder representatives. We are also we have been trained Amy Wickham who will speak later of UNICEF, and then Sean Wahara has experience uh, at his company Clarity Movement, a for-profit company, uh, working with Latin America and other uh, LMIC cities around the world with low-cost sensors. So I'll stop there and turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. 
um, and uh, to speak here with this um, auspicious panel. It's already been really exciting information. Um, I'm from the American Lung Association, um, and we're the leading organization working to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease through research, education, and advocacy. We work to achieve this mission by focusing on a number of strategic initiatives, including championing clean air for all. As you folks know, if you can't measure it, you can't fix it. Having access to credible localized air pollution data that we can share with the public and with policymakers is critical to our work. We're really excited to be working with the HACAST team to explore some opportunities to better tell our story with the amazing data that NASA is making available. One key way that the Lung Association conveys information about the air quality data and health risks associated with air pollution is through our annual State of the Air Report. State of the Air 2021, which will be released on April 21st, will be our 22nd annual edition. In this report, we translate information about ozone and fine particulate matter air pollution into a report card to better help people understand their air quality and how to protect themselves and their families. The report card format is easy to understand and commands an enormous amount of national and local attention from air quality advocates and the media. The report uses the most recent quality assured air pollution data collected by federal, state, local, and tribal air agencies. These data come from official monitoring sites, and we follow EPA's lead in using three years of data averaged together. Because we only use data that's been quality assured by EPA, there's a one-year time lag. So the 2021 data report will use data from 2017, 2018, and 2019. We generate grades for ozone and 24-hour spikes in fine particulate matter for all counties with monitoring data using a weighted average based on the number of days the pollutant levels fall into the air quality index zones for healthy, unhealthy, hazardous, et cetera. We also assign pass-fail marks to counties for their year-round PM 2.5 levels. In addition to air quality data, we also include population estimates for counties uh, at disproportionate, for population estimates per county for groups at disproportionate risk from exposure to air pollution, including children and adults with asthma, COPD, heart disease, lung cancer, smoking history, and low income. Last year, for the first time, based on growing evidence, we added uh, people of color. To give you an idea of our findings, last year's State of the Air report found that nearly half of the people in the US live in counties with unhealthy levels of ozone or particulate pollution. People of color are one and a half times more likely than white people to live in a county that has one failing grade and 3.7 times more likely to live in a county with all three failing grades. So State of the Year is a big report and we're enormously proud of the success it's had, but there are definitely some needs and opportunities for improvement. One big gap we'd like to be able to fill is to provide information about the air they are breathing to people living in all those counties where there are no monitors. Most of them are in the rural heartlands where air pollution levels have historically been assumed to be low. But with population growth, expansion of natural gas development, wildfires, and climate change, we're concerned that the monitoring network may not be keeping up. It would be so helpful to address air quality monitoring gaps with reliable, usable air quality data for counties with no air monitors. And we understand that satellite data might be able to help with that. Another thing we cannot do with our current methodology is to drill down on inequities in exposure at the community level. We know that exposures vary dramatically between neighborhoods within a metropolitan area, but state of the air cannot tease out that for people. And last on my list for today, but I'm sure there are lots of other great ideas out there, is that state of the air, as you might be able to tell by my presentation, is all words and numbers. We don't have any images or graphic representation of all that data. We know we're living in a visual world and visuals to portray air pollution to the public, including wildfire smoke, will help us communicate our health message more effectively. So thank you for your time and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Great, thank you so much, um, Catherine and Brian and Tracy. That was really, really fantastic. 
So uh, we have some discussion happening in the chat. And so I see that Tracy has already answered um, one of the questions, which is great. Um, and we have a comment um, from Robert Judge, Catherine, that says EPA strives to ensure all regulatory monitors by the end of May 2021 for the 2020 and 2018 and 2019 years. Um, and actually, this comment um, kind of triggers a question that, that you know, it's interesting to hear that right now you're relying on the um, the quality assured data, but you noted this interest in in using other products that fill the gaps. Um, and so I was just curious as to how sort of how you might think about incorporating that, or the extent to which you still would want to rely on EPA or some sort of you know external quality assurance for data before incorporating it into your reports. I think that's a, that's a great question, Arlene, and that's really not one I'm prepared to answer at this stage, other than we would obviously have to, um, you know, um, work with experts to look at our, our methodologies and, um, and how best to do that. And we've talked to Tracy about, um, you know, some ideas about um, the modeling and how to integrate, um, but it would take a change and, and we, you know, as a volunteer led organization, uh, we would we would want to um, talk to um, get a variety of opinions from experts on, on how best to do that. Thank you. Including um, a lot of the people in this room. <laughs> thank you. Um, so there was a question um, from Dan Westervelt asking specific to Brian about the role of low cost sensors in your project and is there a plan to calibrate or fuse with satellite data? Yeah. Uh, since the our Haycast project just began uh, in January, we've been discussing internally among, with our team on just how to approach the whole issue of low cost sensors. Uh, we have, we're, at the moment, we're planning to uh, how we're going to begin interacting with our cities. So we actually haven't talked with our cities about the low cost sensors issue just yet. Uh, so it will, a lot will depend on what they want, what they're capable of doing. Uh, but one thing that we did talk about very clearly already is that we need to uh, leverage and collaborate with other existing efforts such as yours with Africair. Uh, so you'll be hearing from us uh, very likely in the future. And if you have any ideas on how to integrate low cost sensors uh, into uh, the standard operating procedures, uh, I'll certainly be happy to, to listen to you and, and to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, so I see that we're already out of time. These sessions are going to fly by, I can tell. Um, but so thank you very much to our panelists. And I hope that the discussion will continue um, in the breakout rooms and in the chat and uh, look forward to the rest of the meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. That was an amazing conversation. And I can't wait for the breakout rooms to continue it here. Let me start sharing my screen back again and we'll pivot right to session two satellite data for global health and in this session we're going to have three guest speakers uh first speaker today is dr susan annenberg from george washington university then we have dr randall martin from washington university and finally we have dr paolo vipont from health effects institute welcome everyone and susan whenever you're ready we can start with you Great, thank you so much. And it, it truly is a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to be talking with all of you today, um, to be engaging in this conversation with, um, with my fellow colleagues and scientists and stakeholders and anyone who's interested in using satellite remote sensing for air quality and, and for public health. Um, I just wanted to start by showing the breadth of our team here. We have quite a, a number of people from different institutions with different job functions and different expertise. Um, and it's so important to have that kind of interdisciplinary uh, nature here because the, the work that we're putting together um, on satellite-based uh, nitrogen dioxide and NOx emissions is useful in so many different contexts. And we're very excited to hear um, about the needs that our stakeholders have and figure out how we can produce uh, data and make data more available for people to use for, di for different purposes. So we're focusing on uh, nitrogen dioxide, satellite-derived NO2. Um, NO2 is, of course, a precursor to ground-level ozone and fine particulate matter. 
Um, so it's an important precursor to be targeting for uh, mitigating those uh, pollutants that are responsible for the major portion of the burden of disease from, from air pollution. Uh, but NO2 is also increasingly recognized um, as a uh, pollutant that is um, associated with health impacts in its own right as a marker of traffic-related air pollution. Um, so this project actually stems from work that we started in the last HACAS team, working with uh, Michael Brower from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation to do the first estimate of the global burden of nitrogen dioxide on pediatric asthma incidence. That's new cases of asthma among children worldwide. Um, and we've been working towards uh, integrating the, uh, this new risk and outcome pair NO2 and pediatric asthma incidence into the Global Burden of Disease Study, um, further supported by the Health Effects Institute. And we have um, Paula V. Pons on our uh, project here who will be speaking uh, shortly as well. Um, so we're doing this, uh, these um, satellite-derived estimates of nitrogen dioxide, not just for public health surveillance as part of the Global Burden of Disease, but also environmental policy planning. Um, so you see that we have, uh, we have some um, colleagues from the International Council on Clean Transportation and from C40 and from the US EPA um, who we're working with to try to understand how do we uh, mitigate NOx emissions at different scales to uh, reduce both air pollution health impacts and um, environmental justice issues. Next slide, please. I just want to give a, a quick flavor of the types of products that we're producing here. So we're looking at uh, three types of products, nitrogen dioxide concentrations, NO2 disease burdens, and NOx emissions. And again, I want to highlight the different scales here. So we're looking all the way from the urban scale all the way up to the global scale and trying to make these data sets available as uh, widely as possible so that people can use these, this information for uh, many different purposes. Next slide, please. Um, and I know this is kind of a, a, a tough slide to read. I'm not expecting you to read this, but I, I just wanted to show really quickly the, the different types of data sets that we're gonna be integrating here. And I'm really excited about Tempo as John Haynes was uh, describing it and the, the level of uh, temporal and spatial information that we're gonna get about nitrogen dioxide from, from that uh, instrument. Um, and again, we're, we're delivering several different types of data sets from NO2 concentrations to NO2 attributable, attributable asthma burdens and NOx emissions um, with, with uh, several different decision-making applications, including environmental and public health surveillance with the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and the CDC, um, public policy development with uh, C40 cities and the International Council on Clean Transportation, and then policy relevant research, we want our estimates to be available for epidemiologists and other researchers. And we're very excited to hear from uh, folks about how we can make these data more available and accessible to uh, for a variety of different purposes. So I'll hand it over now to my colleague, Dr. Randall Martin. Thank you, Susan. And it's a pleasure to introduce our project today to support the health and air quality management communities by advancing satellite-based estimates of PM2.5. Many thanks to the collaborators on this project, Michael Brower that you just heard about from Susan Annenberg, Shobha Kondragunta, Phil Dickerson, and Alex Descherbinen. On the next slide, please, motivates this project with the growing recognition of outdoor PM2.5 as the leading environmental risk factor for the global burden of disease with millions of attributable deaths each year. Deaths that are valued by the OECD at a few percent of global GDP, trillions of dollars and projected to grow. At the bottom, you see a number of mortality risk factors Outdoor PM2.5 is near the top of that list and comparable to other risk factors that we may hear much more about. In light of these concerns, PM2.5 is included into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which require a measurable indicator of progress. But on the next slide, we see that vast areas around the world have grossly inadequate ground-based monitoring for exposure assessment. Many countries in the world have no operational PM2.5 monitoring at all. You might sometimes hear discussion in the media about the most polluted city in the world, but given our gaps in ground-based monitoring, it is quite likely that city is unmonitored. 
To meet even a basic goal of one monitor per million inhabitants would require thousands of new monitors with immense costs and logistical challenges. And that then motivates on the next slide, the opportunity to build from a suite of advances across our community with developments in instrumentation and retrieval algorithms to infer aerosol optical depth at increasingly, with increasing accuracy and precision at increasingly fine resolution. These data can then be fused using observations from aerosol optical depth to produce an overall composite estimate, um, inversely weighting by their errors with respect to Aeronet. And then coincidentally sample a chemical transport model to calculate the time and space varying relationship between aerosol optical depth and PM2.5 to produce a geoscience-based estimate of PM2.5 that can be then statistically fused with ground-based observations to produce an overall estimate that one sees an example on the next slide, please. And the numbers are striking. They vary from less than 10 micrograms per cubic meter over parts of the Americas where we do have concerns about air quality and then extend out to 100 micrograms per cubic meter over densely populated areas. By providing an observationally constrained estimate, it's proving a valuable information source for a large number of international assessments some of which you see listed at the bottom. On the next slide, we also see that these data are used for a variety of epidemiologic studies to assess the association of PM2.5 with a variety of health outcomes, with a variety of cohorts and a variety of environments. And so this leads me to my final slide on the next slide that then our overall arching project objective to support this large user community of satellite derived PM2.5 and contribute to informed decision-making activities across the health and air quality management communities. We'll do so by increasing the availability and timeliness of these satellite derived PM2.5 estimates. We'll build upon the recent HACAS2 review of PM2.5 data sets and offer more accessible data formats, address user needs and improve documentation. We'll endeavor to promote understanding of the data attributes and its limitations extend to more recent years. And I aspire to collaborate broadly across the HACAST entire community to achieve those objectives. With that, let me thank you for your attention and I'll turn it over to Pallavi Pont. Thank you so much, Randall. Um, and I actually want to just start by thanking Tracy, Susan, Alex, and the entire HACAS team for um, inviting me here and our uh, State of Global Air and Health Effects Institute team for some of the insights and ideas that I'm going to be sharing today. Um, what you see here on this uh, slide is a global map of exposures to PM2.5 in 2019. Randall um, very graciously just walks, walked us through the process that leads to this. But what I want to draw attention uh, to is the amount of information we can see here for countries around the world, even countries where we know that air quality monitoring data from uh, reference stations is hardly available, if at all. And to me, this is such a powerful example of how satellite data can help us in expanding our understanding of air quality and health in countries around the world. And this map, in fact, is one of the many products that are available on our website, State of Global Air, which is a result of a very long-term collaboration between the Health Effects Institute and the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. For the last four years, we've been producing this uh, State of Global Air report and website and trying to bring this broad suite of data on air quality trends, health trends to people around the world. And over time, we've seen users ranging from scientists to journalists to policymakers in some cases, advocacy groups and think tanks in, in countries spread really across the world, use this information. And what drives a lot of this is the work that um, Randall and others uh, who are on the call today have done trying to help improve our understanding of PM exposures, ozone exposures. And now we're very excited to also add uh, nitrogen dioxide exposures to the work that Susan has been doing and enabling others to make decisions. And 
since we are following right after um, Catherine from American Lung Association, I also wanted to add that the inspiration for this work actually came from the state of air report that the Lung Association has been putting out for a very long time. So there are some synergies here that we can continue to build on. Next slide, please. As a stakeholder representative, I want to just highlight a few things that I think have been a part of the HACAST conversations already, but would be worth thinking about uh, going forward. First of all, satellite data is being increasingly used by people around the world, including stakeholders like our organization and, and others, but also by journalists and by public. One really good example uh, I would like to highlight here is the use of fire count data in South Asia to try and understand what's happening with agricultural fires, especially during the winter season when air pollution levels are really high and agricultural fires tend to be very common. And what's really inspiring at this stage is to see that it's not just scientists using this information, but government officials in some cases, journalists, and even interested and concerned members of the public, because the data and the information is very easily available, it's very accessible, um, and it's you know allowing people to, to use it in a myriad number of ways. And I'd really like to thank um, Pavan Gupta, who I think is on the call today, who's been working very closely with people in the region to get them up to speed on how to use the information, how to understand what the data means. And I'm hoping that through the second phase of Haycast, we can continue expanding uh, the usage and the availability of tools that people can begin to use both here in the US and, and worldwide. Second, um, as a representative from an institution that funds a lot of research on air quality and health, we would also like to see better integration across folks who are working with satellite-based data and those who are conducting health studies. Randall had a very impressive list of uh, studies that have already started integrating this information in very uh, strong and creative ways. And a number of studies that HEI is funded in recent years are also drawing on these um, satellite data and products. So we hope we can continue to keep this um, going. And with applications such as Maya coming, we can begin to address some of the other questions that are still um, outstanding in terms of our research understanding of uh, air pollution and health connections. Finally, I think HACAST has been doing a really good job um, of this, but continuing to communicate with different user groups, both within, um, you know, within the groups that are engaged with the broader HACAS network and others, and trying to identify opportunities for uh, expanding usage of tools. With new satellite products, there's often a learning curve for people to get up to speed and be able to use it. So identifying opportunities to minimize that in some ways. And on the other end of the spectrum, engaging with policymakers wherever possible and trying to expand usage of satellite-based data in air quality monitoring. It's beginning to happen in some of the countries, especially um, in the low and middle income countries where ground monitoring is limited. People are turning to satellite data as, as a way of understanding what's going on uh, at a broader sort of national scale or regional scale. And it would be helpful to think through ways to um, facilitate that in a better way. And I'll close with, uh, with a shout out to Tracy who actually participated in one such discussion uh, in India recently. So hopefully we can, through the course of this project, continue to build on those conversations. Next slide, please. Um, I would just like to thank you all for uh, you know, joining today. And I'm very excited to continue the work that HACAST is proposing to do and also figure out ways for State of Global Air and NHEI to contribute. So please get in touch if you have ideas and I look forward to discussions later. Great, thank you all so much. Um, this has been a great set of uh, uh, presentations. Uh, a couple of questions from the uh, chat. Um, two folks have asked about um, the speciation of PM 2.5. And I'm wondering if you could, um, any of you could comment on the, um, 
on the you know capabilities now or in the future and i know amber soha made a comment in the chat as well but you know about the speciating pm 2.5 in addition to total mass yeah, thank you for that question. That's a, a real challenge because the signals of composition from backscattered sunlight that are used for the derivation of PM 2.5, the co co component specific signals are weak, but there are signals. And so for the Maya mission, for example, is a multi-angle polarimeter with a broad spectral range that's de designed to glean additional information about chemical composition. And that together with targeted ground-based measurements uh, within my primary target areas offers information to tease out that composition. There are also opportunities to inform uh, composition through trace gas observations. So connecting with the TEMPO mission that offers information about gaseous species that provide precursors to uh, chemical components. Uh, so there's a variety of different ways to feed in that information, but the point is that it is also a challenge that we need to invest a great deal of energy to achieve. Great, uh, thank you. Um, another question, and this is, you know, I think something that may be different for different data products, um, but what is about the role of ground-based data and how is it, is it used to validate the derived near surface PM 2.5 or is it used to assimilate uh, sorry, yeah, validation or assimilation or some combination? So in the case of our satellite derived PM 2.5, we produce first of all geophysical estimates that are independent of those ground-based observations. And those exhibit a high degree of skill. The R squared is 0.8, uh, slope within 10% of unity. Then the statistical fusion, so akin to an assimilation, but not quite, it's, it's statistical. Um, brings in those ground-based observations and explains an additional 10% of the variance. So in that flavor of satellite-derived PM 2.5, the contribution of ground direct ground-based observations is, is moderate uh, to the overall estimates. There are different varieties of PM 2.5 estimates that one could discuss in more detail if we had time. Great. Yeah. And actually, we will have more time in the breakout session and in the chat. So please feel free to keep this going at those two places. And a real quick, we're at time, but I just want to ask Susan Annenberg about um, the potential of Knox products for climate applications. Yes, thank you. That's an exciting, a really exciting area. Um, we can actually use Knox emissions to try to estimate uh, carbon dioxide emissions coming from cities as well. So I think that this is going to be an area that we're, uh, our team is particularly interested in exploring given the, the scale, the geographic uh, coverage of of NOx data that, that may not be available right now for CO2. Um, how do we use that? How do we leverage that um, additional information about NOx to try to generate estimates of, of uh, CO2 emissions? Thank you. And I'll hand it back to Alex to take us into the next session. Thank you, speakers. Awesome. That was absolutely great. Thank you so much again. Here, let me start sharing my screen again. And all right, we're going to be moving on to session three, improved valuation of fires and impacts. We're gonna have three speakers here, starting with Dr. Jing Chu Mao from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, Dr. Amber Soja from the National Institute of Aerospace Associates, and finally, Mark Smith from the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll start off with Dr. Mao. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to join this team. And uh, let me start uh, with a uh, team of great people I have fortune to work with. Uh, so I will, first of all, I will introduce Dr. Martin Stufer from Universal Alaska Fairbanks. Also, I want to introduce myself a little as well. I'm, I am from Alaska, uh, Universal Alaska Fairbanks, as well as Dr. Jun Wang and Dr. Jesse Zhang from University of Iowa, and Dr. Ed Heyer from Naval Research Laboratory. Um, our stakeholders include uh, Barbara Toast, Mark Smith, which you're gonna hear from, uh, Shortly, from they are from Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, Heidi Strider, Eric Stevens, Jen Jenkins from Alaska Interagency Coordination Center (AICC), Edison York from Alaska Fire Science Consortium, and Manso Nielsen from Institute for Tribal Environmental Pro Professionals. So, our focus will be on Boreal Forest Fire. Next slide, please. 
so before I move up to Alaska, uh, I did not realize how big Alaska is. So here I'm showing you that on the left side, Alaska actually accounts for 18% of US land mass. It's a huge um, place. And uh, also it's a place uh, account for a major fraction of wildfire burning areas. So if you look at the upper red panel, which is a burning area in Alaska in past couple of decades, you can see the burning areas in some years vary from three to seven meaning uh, acres burning area per year. So if you look at the uh, lower right panel, which is the total burning area for United States, that is about somewhere between five to 10. So basically Alaska can account for 30 to 50% of burning area in United States. So, so that's a pretty big area to burn. Um, next slide, please. And we also, I also want to point out, as uh, many of you have mentioned in previous slides, that uh, we need ground, ground based measurements. Alaska is a place that actually has very little ground based measurements. And uh, this really poses a challenge for air quality forecast. Here I'm showing you uh, six panels. If you look at lower three panels, those are from satellite pictures. One is from MODIS fire detection, one is from MODIS AOD, one is from tsunami NOP. Uh, AOD, they are issuing a similar pattern. But if we look at top three panels, those are from three models for surface PM 2.5. I really want to point out the, the middle panel on, on the upper row. You can see that uh, the color, color scale is very different. It's actually different by factor five than the one on the left and the one on the right, because the model just differs so much. We had to use different color scale to plot them together. And you basically from the top three panels, you can see some model can be higher than our models by factor of 10. The question, question is, which is correct? Actually, we need that information for, uh, for a lot of uh, air strong needs for aviation planning, for, um, uh, for, for air quality uh, decision making, and um, uh, even for tourism. For, for, for example, a lot of people come to Alaska in summer to, for, uh, for sightseeing. And uh, this is a big problem right now, but we don't know which one's correct. Next slide, please. I, I want to point out that actually border force fire is kind of unique compared to the fire in middle latitude. They are largely smoldering. This is from picture of um, satellite, uh, another satellite is largely smoldering. And a lot of fires, they are just inaccessible. They're so far away, just cannot be put out right away or people do not really put them out. And often those fires are, are long lasting. They can burn for, e for, for months, for weeks. And uh, so, this can be a big uh, problem for a lot of um, air quality issues and for tribe environment for many local residents. And uh, next slide, please. So our, our uh, project is we are proposing a new framework to improve air quality forecast in Alaska. So we are proposing to use NASA satellite. We are proposing to use ground-based measurements. We're also proposing to use uh, purple air local sensors and we in integrate those into different models, then we're gonna be using an uh, ensemble common filter to provide a better air quality forecast for the next three to five days. So people can take immediate actions to, so they can mitigate this uh, health effect from air quality. And uh, uh, I want to mention that this ensemble common filter will be based on Dr. John's recent paper. And uh, this is where we will be starting, but we, are, uh, we welcome any comments on our methodology. Um, with that, I will turn the floor to to Amber Soja, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, these talks have been fantastic. Uh, thank you for all of them. Uh, we are going to focus on quantifying pollution um, of smaller prescribed burn in the southeastern United States. And that's because our national emissions inventory in the southeast is, is known to be inaccurate. So our partners, are our collaborators are, are at the EPA at universities. So we have modelers and health experts and regional experts and also um, several universities and the USDA Forest Service and a nonprofit, Tall Timbers. And what they do is they uh, teach people how to burn lands, prescribed burns, and they burn a lot of land. So they're a really good contact to have. Next slide, please. 
Um, as we all know, smoke is a pollutant that's related to respiratory diseases, cardiovascular symptoms, heart attacks, and even death. Um, smoke exposure in the health community and firefighting community uh, is in the billions. So this is, this is expensive. Um, and the Western fires receive a lot of notoriety because climate is a problem and they're a big problem. And they're continuing to increase, especially in the extreme fire seasons. And also in the Arctic, the Arctic has had a uh, very extreme fire seasons in 2019 and 2020, also under the conditions of changes in climate. So while all of these changes are extreme and important, so is burning of the small fires in the southeast. What you might not know is in a normal fire year, the burning in the southeast is equivalent to the amount of area burned in the rest of the United States to include Alaska and the West. And that's in prescribed and small, burned areas, but we still don't have a handle on it. We don't really know um, how much area is burned there because it's hard. It's a complicated area to quantify. Uh, for example, 92% of the fire in Florida is prescribed, but only 25% of the burned area is defined uh, using any kind of inventories, except if you went state to state, and, and most states do not keep records, um, and certainly not for cropland burning. So if you look at the top left, this is one flight of the figure on the top left uh, from FireXAQ on the 21st. And of the fires we sampled, GOES detected 83% of them, GOES five minute data, and MODIS detected 25%, VIRS detected 42%, that's for that particular day. On the bottom left, we're showing GOES, MODIS, and VIRS data of the Castle Fire. So with these data, you can see just how much that GOES data shown in the green covers. So you can actually quantify a diurnal cycle with GOES five minute data. However, the resolution of MODIS and VIRS is, is higher so that there are times where you can only detect uh, smaller fires or fires that are burning not as hot uh, with MODIS and VIRS. So you also see days with only MODIS and VIRS. So all of the instruments are important. And on the right-hand side, uh, we show some examples of Sentinel-2 and the Everglades and also Google Earth and more Sentinel-2 on these two images, just to show you that we can do this. Um, that if we put together different types of data, we can start to tease apart the amount of area that truly burned uh, with multiple types of data. Next slide, please. So on the right-hand side, you're seeing the Blackwater River State Forest, which was one of the uh, prescribed burns that we planned um, during the time that the 2019 FireXAQ campaign was taking uh, place. So the movie is showing the master data that was on the plane. And we've used planet data in the top right to quantify, um, to better quantify the amount of burned area. So as I said, for this project, we're gonna focus on the central and south sea east. We're gonna use multiple data sources, everything we can find in order to quantify this inventory, particularly focused on 2019. And then we're going to use this inventory to establish relationships with all the satellites, with one satellite, with different satellites, and work with the EPA and anyone who would be interested to work with us and to ask the question, does this make a difference? Next slide, please. And we, we know that fires that are prescribed fires in the Southeast or anywhere, um, they have a lot of benefits. So there are benefits to mitigating wildland fire risk. We, we know that. But how to balance these risks with smoke management, air quality, and human health, these are complex questions. And we don't have the data that we need in order to even make these decisions in the central and southeast. As a matter of fact, the emissions inventories are so poor in the central and southeast that we can't even ask questions um, such as, is it more important uh, or what are the health effects due to extreme fire seasons and extreme fires in the west in comparison to persistent prescribed fires and cropland fires in the east. So we don't have enough information in order to model uh, the health effects from these two different types of fires. And that's one reason we believe that this research is, is very important. Um, and as climate changes, balancing these 
choices of the landscapes we want, how much we burn, what is our air quality, climate is changing, ecosystems are changing. These are going to be going to become very important questions. Are they already are? And so in this, this panel, we're showing some pre-burn images from planet scope data. We also have some land, uh, Landsat and Sentinel data. Also is another example to show you that we can see these fires after they burn, but they green up really quickly. Um, and then they become impossible, difficult to impossible to distinguish in just a few days. And I think that's my last slide. You might want to go next, Alex, and make sure that good. And I'm going to turn this over to Mark. Thanks. Hey, how you doing? Thanks. Um, I'm the air quality forecaster um, or meteorologist for the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation here in Alaska. Um, my department is responsible for issuing air quality advisories alerts for volcanic and wildland fire episodes for the state of Alaska. Slide. As you can see, the area responsible, responsible for is quite extensive, roughly about 586,000 square miles. And unfortunately, here in Alaska, we lack the infrastructure to support a DEC air quality monitoring network large enough to cover the entire area. Currently, the department incorporates products from other agencies into the advisory and alert decision matrix. Slide. Here you go. We have a, a, few, of the, a few of the following products. Um, helps us identify and track plumes in the region. Um, the main one <clears throat> for the initial identification is NASA's worldview, uh, the MODIS fire overlay. Um, it helps identify current hot spots that may be already producing smoke or has the potential under ide ideal atmospheric conditions to blow up. Works great under high pressure, i.e. Uh, clear skies, but unfortunately we do have quite a bit of weather that moves through. So we do have to rely on some surface-based um, monitoring. Um, the surface visibility from, let's see, we have the FA weather cams. That's a graphic that you see to the right. The National Weather Service and MesaWest observational database. The surface visibility from these sites can be used to determine a current air quality index based on uh, the visibility chart in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. So basically anything under six miles, we start looking at as a potential air quality uh, advisory to issue. Once we identify the smoke and its source, um, then we move on to forecasting its movement. We utilize the Air Force Weather Web Services for upper air modern, model streamlines to help forecast future movement of the air parcel containing the smoke. And we also use the U.S. Forest Service Blue Sky Playground. That's a great tool. Um, once we know the fuels that are identified that are burning, it helps us forecast how much PM 2.5 is going to be uh, added to the atmosphere. And the last tool um, on this slide here, we have the NOAA's High Split model. It's a great tool for forecasting forward and back trajectory of the air parcels. We add the coordinates of the known fire. We pick the MET forecast we're wanting. And we give, it will give you an idea of where the air parcel will move in the next 6, 12, 24 hours. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you the amount of um, PM 2.5 in that area. So we do have to kind of rely on our, our visibility cameras. And also we do have, um, I guess the Purple Air Network has over the past two years expanded in the region and has aided the department in identifying the presence of smoke. But currently we don't use the advisories or uh, use that data to issue advisories or alerts based on those readings. I think that's all I have. If you have any questions, or turn it back over to Tracy. Thank you all so much. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, so we have one question from Ira Domsky uh, in Maricopa County um, for Jing which is how much of the smoldering occurs below the surface in the peat and how is it known how climate change will affect that smoldering? Thanks, Chris Tracy, and thanks for a great question. I think the burning on ground, including peat as well as the tough layer, that's actually pretty rich organic soil matter, uh, organic matter in the soil. That's pretty um, soft. It's about 60 90 percent. That's a number in my mind. So the majority of the fire is burning on ground. The ground fire uh, is it's much less compared to the fires in middle latitude. So at the majority of fires, they are burning on ground, including peat and, and the, the something above peat. 
so it's just on, all on, uh, on the soil. So that's why it's, they can last forever. But after you burn the organic matter for a while, you can start seeing they're burning the peat underneath. Uh, so it's quite intriguing to see those pictures. Um, but I'm happy to just, I'm, I'll be happy to discuss more later. Yes. Thank you. And um, I have a question for, for Mark um, that, that Amber and Jinku may be able to jump in on. But in terms of the challenges that Alaska faces as such a big state with, as you mentioned, limited monitors, you know, where do you see the biggest opportunity to improve the, the access to the data you need? Is it from satellites or you mentioned low cost monitors or when you think about what's on your wish list? Are there questions that either we could help with or just just uh, for the benefit of discussion? Well, let's see, since we have NASA on the line here, let's, uh, we would like a dedicated satellite put over the state of Alaska with all the suite of, uh, <laughs> of programs. So we'll ask for the big picture and then hopefully we get a little bit, but yeah, increased sensing. We just don't have the infrastructure. You know, it's, it's basically, you get to probably 80% of the the communities by airplane or, or boat. So we don't have the ability to have regu regulatory monitorings set up in Alaska. So we rely heavily on the FAA web cameras and now the purple airs are, are becoming popular and it's a low cost sensor. So low cost sensors that we can incorporate into some type of monitoring network would be greatly improved. Great, Amber or Jim Q, you wanna jump in? I, I just want to say, I know we're making jokes about it, but um, Alaska has had some problems with satellite data and being able to see, to view weather and fire regimes for some time. And it's also true in Siberia. And this is an area, um, the entire Arctic and the new Arctic report card, um, that it's burning deep and it's warming faster than anywhere else. And this is a lot of feedbacks to the climate system. So feedbacks from climate to there, and it's, it's a big deal. Even though we're making jokes, it'd be nice to have a tundra orbit, Brad. <laughs> and Brad, Brad mentioned that Canada is considering the, that orbit. So uh, that, that may be a, the point of uh, moving it out of the joke realm into the reality realm, but uh, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, I think, Mar yeah, okay, go ahead. sorry. No, no, go ahead. I think Amber got a, has a really great point that often the, the, the fire is smoldering, often the temperature is not so high, satellite really cannot see that. My colleague Martin Silver has a paper showing that 40% of fire cannot be detected by satellite, actually in Alaska. Uh, so it's pretty big deal. And thing I wanna say that we really want to combine the local sensor and satellite, you know, to have a better system, to integrate that to, for a better air quality forecast in the future. So I would say combination of local sensor and NASA satellite would be something we are aiming for at this point. Yeah, that, that, that's great. And, and I think actually that's maybe, uh, Jin-Q, if you could put a link to that study in the chat, um, that would be helpful. And, and Mark, just so you know, there's another question from Daniel Tong in the chat that maybe you can answer. We're out of time for this session and Ira has a, good, a great point here. So I think let's keep it going in the chat, but also in the breakout session for this, this panel. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Alex to introduce our next speakers. Yeah, wow, this was a great conversation. Thank you all so much. Let me start sharing my screen again. All right, we're gonna pivot over to session four now, which is satellite data for new decision support applications. We have three speakers here today. Dr. Pawan Gupta from the University's Space Research Association at Columbia University, Dr. Daniel Tong from George Mason University, and Stephanie Crystal is joining us from the US Department of State. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. And uh, Dr. Gupta, whenever you're ready, we'll start with you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, can you go to the slide? Thanks. So let me just make a slight correction. Uh, I'm still with the University of Space Research Association and NASA Marshall. I did not move to Columbia. Uh, so that was just a typo. Um, so our project is going to work with the US State Department, uh, where uh, especially US embassies, uh, uh, where they have uh, all around the world, there are about 270 locations. And the idea is to build the capacity and integrate the satellite observation into their decision support system. So we will use all the NASA resources and bring that to the State Department's decision support system. Uh, in our team, we have uh, Dr. Sundar Christopher, is a professor of atmospheric sciences here at uh, University of Alabama in Huntsville. And he is among the one uh, who actually um, first 
uh, started using satellite data for PM 2.5 monitoring. Uh, we have Kel Marker. Uh, he has been working with NASA Survey Program for a long time. Uh, he has great experience in actually taking the complex satellite observation and converting that into easy to use format and tools for end user applications. We have Caroline D'Angelo. Uh, she is the lead for uh, Department of State's Global Air Quality Monitoring Program. Uh, Dr. Robert Levy, uh, he has been um, working in the field on uh, retrieving aerosol information from multiple satellite from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And then in uh, terms of collaborator, we have uh, Malini Patel from, uh, again, Department of State. Uh, she is going to play a critical role in actually using some of the data sets which we will produce through this project and use for health applications and trying to see how the uh, uh, department starts, employees health are changing because of the new forecasting which we are going to provide. Uh, John Kerkey is also a department of states. He works with the global partners and Christoph Keller, uh, again from the Goddard, who is expert in uh, chemical transport modeling. So next slide, please. Uh, so our project has two main objective. One is uh, end user engagement and capacity building on Earth observation. So when we uh, are saying that we are going to uh, integrate satellite observation model data into the Department of State's uh, decision support system, it also brings in uh, a requirement to train uh, people who are going to use so that they can interpret the data in correct way. So that will be done through many workshops, uh, need assessment workshops and training activities. And the second objective uh, of our baseline activity is uh, providing uh, this hourly forecast uh, uh, calibrated uh, at each embassy locations and the historical data uh, for almost last past two decades coming out from the multiple satellites. And these will be done uh, at uh, uh, all of the US embassy locations. So the approach which we are going to use here is uh, we will uh, definitely use the satellite measurements, which includes uh, aerosols and fire data from MODIS and Beer satellite specifically. The model simulation, we, as many of you know, the NASA has this global model called GEOS, which assimilates uh, millions of satellite uh, measurements every day, and that provides actually an advanced forecast on many uh, components of air quality. And then, of course, there are satellite uh, surface measurements, which kind of, uh, uh, which uh, our partner from the DOS is going to talk next. They have surface measurement on many embassy location, which will actually be serve as a critical validation and calibration tool for that. And all these data sets um, uh, coming from different sources, different models, satellite will be integrated into a machine learning algorithm so that we can actually uh, take this global forecast and uh, bring that to the local embassy locations uh, to provide a more accurate forecast. Um, so we will do this through uh, various activities, as I mentioned, capacity building. We will have this uh, system called City Air Quality Forecasting System. Uh, we will have health impact and assessment will be done by the uh, folks at the um, uh, Department of States. So next slide, please. So once uh, uh, we are done with this uh, project, uh, our uh, end goal is to achieve something like that it means for each embassy location, uh, we will have uh, long term data records, we will have a daily satellite imageries, uh, not including just for the visuals, as well as the derived product in terms of their PM 2.5 air quality categories, uh, it will have capabilities to do the intercomparisons, look for long term trends look for how things are changing between day and night, between morning and afternoons uh, from the model. And then ultimately some of this information will get into uh, some of the tools which the State Department is planning and uh, working, including the phone app uh, for their employee and other people's awareness. So, uh, and we have a speaker um, in our session next who will talk a little bit more about the State Department's uh, uh, air quality programs. So I think that's all I have and uh, I will pass on to Daniel for next presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Pavan. 
Uh, I'm Daniel Tong from Georgia Mason University. Our project is going to work on uh, the ensemble forecasting of air quality hazards, mostly focused on wildfires and dust storms. We are supported by a large excellent collaborators and core investigators. We have Susan Annenberg from Georgia Washington University and Mark uh, Golovich from New York University. We have Anton Damilo from NASA Gata and Scott Van Pelt, uh, he's uh, gonna help us with the soil application from the USDA capacity. And we have Yun Yao Li, uh, she's working with us, uh, George Mason. Our stakeholders, including uh, WMO, Alexander, he is the focal point of uh, dust initiative uh, under WMO. We have Juan Castillo, who was uh, in this meeting, but he just uh, temporarily stepped out. He will be back soon. And we have Andrea, uh, uh, who is uh, chairing the Pan America Center of the WMO DASA Initiative. Uh, finally, we got uh, several uh, federal agencies. Uh, we have Edward Heyer and Peng Shen from Naval Research Lab. They're going to help us uh, to integrate the Naval Research uh, Forecast, uh, the, the Forecast System into the ensemble. We have Mark Cohen and Barry Baker from NOAA. And Scott DeBells, I believe he is also. Uh, on this call. He's the air quality manager from Pinal County. We are working with him to um, provide a high resolution forecasting for his county. We have Benjamin Spo uh, from New York University who can help us to integrate the data into city health dashboard. And we have Alexi and Ralph uh, from Gata who is a provider. It's gonna, uh, they are gonna provide us uh, with help with using NASA also products. Okay, next slide. So why we are doing this? We all know that air pollution uh, is coming down because anthropogenic emissions uh, in, the United generally, uh, in the United States generally is decreasing because of advance in technology. And also we are switching energy to uh, you know, more cleaner sources uh, such as uh, 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 your um, uh, regenerable source. And then also uh, we are switching to natural gas instead of coal. However, at the same time, extreme events uh, such as wildfire and dust storms on the rise. So on the left is a, a, a time series that our group have generated that's showing the number of dust storms in the past three decades. Uh, even it's not changing uh, from year to, to year uh, chronically. However, the up tipping trend is, is pretty obvious. Uh, you're seeing the increase from uh, 20, uh, 2019 90 to the 2000s. Actually, in the past 20 years, the frequency of dust storm has increased by 240%. On the right, it's showing the frequency of wildfires. This is a work by the NASA Recover Project uh, provided by uh, Case Web. It's also showing that uh, there's an increased trend of uh, wildfires. Actually, in the past 20 years, this is this is regular start from 1950. But just in the 20, uh, past 20 years, uh, that, that including 60% uh, of all the wildfires being record, recorded. So both dust storms and the wildfires causing uh, several billion to $80 billion from year to year, but their distribution are very different. For wildfires, uh, it's caused mostly by one or few billion dollar disasters. Like for example, the campfire in 2018, it's cost uh, about $15 billion. For dust storms, it's actually less noticed uh, because most of dust storms are very small and not causing a lot of attention, but they are happening uh, a lot. You know, it's almost a year around uh, from Florida to Alaska. Uh, you can, uh, you will be surprised, but if you search dust storm in Florida, you can see that a dust storm in Florida actually shut down highways like Highway 10. Go to the next slide. So our goal is trying to improve our collective capability to predict the dust storms and wildfires. And of course, this is a big problem. Uh, we have uh, several speakers, several teams actually trying to tackle this problem. And uh, we are looking forward to working with them. Our goal actually is trying to focus on uh, two very specific problems. Uh, one is for the dust storm, we are focused on small dust storms from cropland. And those dust storms are more dangerous, come from nowhere, and uh, causing uh, you know, a disproportionately higher 
a, a rate of uh, you know fatal accidents and, and, and other uh, health problems too. And for the wildfire, we're going to focus on very large wildfires uh, that generate a lot of smoke that block the satellite view that, you, that compromise the capability of a satellite to detect a fire and also to correctly retrieve emissions. So we're going to use the inverse emission method using other satellite data and then fire detection trying to correct the fire emissions here. So on the right, as showing the, the road map we have, uh, we're going to predominantly use satellite data to improve uh, emissions through our data uh, emission data simulation technique that our group has been working in the past with our collaborators. And after that, uh, we're going to work with uh, three government agencies, and uh, including NOAA, NASA, and Level Research Lab, working with uh, two regional models, CMAC and high speed, and three global models, uh, NASA's GEOS-5, NOAA's uh, GFAS, ELSO, and then LAMPS model from uh, Level Research Lab. And we're going to work with them to come up with uh, North America regional ensemble forecasting for dust and fire. Okay, with that, uh, we are going to use this data set to uh, help uh, support the user communities that including WMO, CD Health Dashboard, uh, PAHO, USDO, uh, USDA, and state and local agencies. So my last slide, because this is the first month, uh, we just get started with this project, so I don't have any results to show. However, um, this is the, the plan we, uh, we have to support our users, and also uh, we are open for suggestions. So the first uh, the, uh, application will be supporting the New York University's uh, health, uh, City Health Dashboard. It's an initiative founded by a private foundation, the Rob uh, Woods Johnson Foundation. They provide a very Daniel, detailed- I don't want to cut you off, but we're running, we're, I want to make sure we have time for questions in your session, okay? And this is okay. just to move it on to Stephanie. I'll, I'll wrap it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Crystal, and I help manage the Department of State's Air Quality Monitoring Program. Uh, we're very, very excited to be partnering with Powon and uh, the HACAS team to support this project that, as you mentioned, will, will really help us advance air quality decision-making decision, decision -making capacity throughout the department, but, but most especially in, in data-poor locations. As Powan mentioned, uh, the State Department is a very unique government agency uh, and, and entity with tens of thousands of personnel as well as family members at more than 270 locations around the world. Uh, and we've assessed that 80% 80, 80 of these locations are, are estimated to have air pollution beyond uh, US EPA annual standards. Next slide, please. So a little bit more about our program um, to support our personnel's ability to reduce their exposure to poor air pollution uh, or to poor air quality. The department started its air quality monitoring program more than 12 years ago in Beijing. And many of you may be familiar with that story, which is highly regarded as one of the best environmental diplomacy stories um, it, in, in recent memory. Uh, and this program has, has since grown exponentially and supported the installation of more than 60 reference grade air quality monitors at US embassies and consulates, uh, very much to support the health and wellness of our personnel and families by giving them the power and the data, uh, the power to make data informed decisions. There are many secondary effects of this as well, um, but but by the end of the year, we are we will have uh, nearly 80 locations with monitors around the world. Uh, again, many in in very data poor areas. Uh, throughout this, the last 12 years, we have partnered very closely with uh, the US EPA, uh, as well as an air quality uh, contractor to ensure that our program meets EPA guidance, uh, manufacturers guidance, and and standards. And that the data, most especially, is transparent, easily accessible, and comes with EPA health messaging. Uh, this program also advances our work with international partners to share technological best practices, as, as the US is highly regarded throughout the world for, for our, our decades of work on, on air quality. Um, and it also advances science-based decision making as well as sound pollution reduction policies, which is really the end goal for us is to, to make sure 
that the countries that we work with uh, have, have the ability to, to implement these policies. We have really grown over the last several years as well to include a virtual air quality fellows program to support our overseas engagement on this issue. And applications for this fellowship will be open in the next few weeks. And uh, we've got so many air quality experts uh, on, 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 the, on the, um, the call here that I would, I would love to just make a pitch to, to have you all uh, apply or, or any of your colleagues apply when, when that is open. Next slide, please. Uh, recently, we also, as Powan mentioned, uh, released the ZEF Air app, which is the department's air quality map, uh, and it is available on Google Play and Apple app stores. And this uh, app utilizes this reference grade data from AirNow and EPA's AQI and health messaging to provide notifications uh, on all of our international locations. So we're very excited to have KCAS project expand the data availability through this app uh, and advanced dashboards as well. Next slide, please. Looking forward, some of the things that have been have been in the past really important to us and continue to be. Um, these are challenges and opportunities we face in, in working with global air quality data. One of them, as noted by Powell, is forecasting and wider spread near real time data for our locations, particularly those without monitoring is really important for us. We're also working in the low cost sensor testing atmosphere. This, uh, this, this area is really growing in interest among our personnel and globally um, that we looked and we are continually looking at, at ways we can support it. Uh, we're also looking at assessing the impacts of poor air pollution on the medium term exposure. So three to five years or so, maybe a little bit uh, more, but that's uh, really important for our personnel abroad and how long they spend abroad. Uh, and uh, one of the top things on our list is always data accessibility, transparency, and use usability. Um, so we're very excited to work with Powell and his team uh, to address some of these challenges. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you all so much. Um, and um, I see uh, a question to the panel, panel. Are there plans to intersect air quality forecasts from the project with local programs? in these cities and countries. And maybe I'll, I'll direct that toward Stephanie just to start out. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, the work that we do from a management perspective, I work in the Office of Management Strategy and Solutions is very much focused on uh, our internal management policies. However, we work very closely with our environmental uh, and health officers abroad to make sure that our host countries and local governments are very aware of the programs and the technologies that we have. Uh, and we work very closely with them to ensure that they're aware of all of the data, the capacity building support that we have uh, and, and offer this very regularly in our discussions with them. Thanks so much. There's a couple other questions and discussion in the chat, but I'm going to, uh, just in the interest of staying on time, I'm going to pause here. Thank you guys all so much for your great uh, presentations, and I'll hand it back to Alex to, to kick us into the next session. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. That was a great conversation there. Uh, let me start sharing my screen here. And we're going to be moving on to session five, new data and methods across scales, where we have three speakers today. We have Dr. Yang Lu from Emory University, Dr. Jeff Pierce from Colorado State University, and finally, Amy Wickham from UNICEF. Thank you guys so much for talking with us today. And Dr. Lu, whenever you're ready, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, I'm ready. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our project to you, uh, the title of our project is uh, Using Earth Observations to Support National and Global Environmental Health Research and Surveillance. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge our uh, team. We have uh, Dr. Liu Huashi, a, a colleague of mine at Emory. Uh, we have Dr. Leticia Nagora, uh, who's an uh, epidemiologist at the American Cancer Society. Uh, we have Dr. Guan Yu Huang. Uh, who's a, um, a trace gas re uh, retrieval expert at the Spelman College. Uh, and Adeline Yerkes, who represents the uh, National Association of Chronic Disease uh, Directors, one of our uh, partner organizations. And then finally, uh, Professor Ian Hamilton, who represents the uh, Lancet Countdown Project. Uh, next slide, please. The overall goal of our project is to develop long-term satellite-driven products to meet end-user goals for environmental health, education, and outreach, 
research and surveillance. So we designed three projects to work with our uh, three sets of partners. Project uh, one is uh, with uh, Centers uh, for Disease Control and, and Prevention, the US CDC and the NACDD. Uh, project two is to work with uh, the uh, ACS. And project three is to work with the Lancet Countdown Project. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of uh, detail about each of these projects. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, the NACDD uh, is a nonprofit organization composed of uh, 58 state and territorial health department chronic uh, disease directors and their staff. The NACDD connects uh, over 7,000 uh, health professionals. Their goal is to provide support and technical assistance to member state health departments, including territorial and tribal health departments. The NACDD is partnering with CDC to develop a tool called the Skin Cancer Dashboard. Uh, the goal is to use it um, to disseminate uh, and develop educational materials to inform public health practitioners and local policymakers on skin cancer burden, you know, vulnerable populations, potential intervention strategies in their, uh, in their communities. Uh, the, this project uh, for us to, uh, is to provide long-term satellite-based surface UV exposure to, to, uh, to help the, uh, to, to serve as a major input to the skin cancer uh, dashboard. This project grew out of a previous uh, applied science program project where we, we developed a 11-year uh, time series of surface UV exposure, surface UV and solar radiation exposure data sets for the, uh, uh, for the CDC tracking network. As you can see, I, I put a screenshot of the uh, tracking data portal. Um, the, uh, this existing data set covers the, uh, the 48 continental United States. And we're gonna expand the coverage and duration to uh, include Alaska, Hawaii, uh, tribal and, terri uh, and other US territories. And we're gonna expand both ways uh, into history and uh, into more, more recent years using uh, additional satellite sensors. Next slide, please. Now, the, the second project is, uh, in collaboration with the American Cancer Society. Uh, the American Cancer Society is founded in 1913. It's a national community-based voluntary health organization dedicated to eliminating cancer. It has its global headquarters in Atlanta and 250 regional and local offices uh, worldwide. Uh, the ACS conducts research for the causes and treatments of cancer. It also promotes healthy lifestyles to help cancer uh, prevention. So this project uh, aims at uh, assessing the association between exposure to wildland fires and fire smoke in the US and the survival for lung cancer patients following their diagnosis and treatment. Um, so here it's not only about air pollution exposure, um, we are also looking into the, uh, the trauma, the stress related to uh, kind of being proximate to uh, wildfire events and how that affects um, the uh, survival after uh, lung cancer treatment. Uh, here, we're gonna produce a long-term calibrated uh, high resolution PM 2.5 data sets for the US uh, at a high resolution uh, to conduct epidemiological studies with the uh, ACS uh, epidemiologists. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, the, the, the project number three is in collaboration with the Lancet Countdown Project. Uh, the Countdown is an international collaboration established to provide an independent global monitoring system dedicated to tracking uh, the emerging health profile of the changing climate. And uh, Emory has been an official partner with the Countdown Project uh, since 2019. Uh, here, the 20, uh, I, I put a screenshot of the 2020 uh, report indicator uh, contribute, uh, contributed by the uh, Emory team. Here, uh, uh, we provided one of the 43 indicators uh, included in the 2020 uh, Countdown reports. And this indicator is a 
uh, global scale direct population wildfire exposure uh, indicator. Uh, so here for project three, our goal is to refine and enhance the indicators of population direct exposure to wildfire uh, to support uh, future Landsat countdown uh, reports. So uh, yeah, I, I think all the projects that, that uh, will produce large data sets uh, that can potentially uh, benefit other, uh, other users in this community and we uh, welcome uh, collaborations and feedbacks. Thank you and that's all. All right, so uh, I'm Jeff Pierce from Colorado State University and I'm gonna talk about our project, which is fused earth observations of multiple air pollutants for health and research decision-making. And so uh, the core team shown here is me, Emily Fisher and Bonnie Ford, who are atmospheric scientists and air pollution experts, all with experience in modeling, remote sensing, and, and use of in-situ measurements. And Emily in particular has a lot of um, expertise in diversity, equity, and inclusion that I think will be valuable for bringing to this team. And finally, Cheryl Magazamin is an environmental epidemiologist uh, that connects pollution exposures to health outcomes. We also have um, collaborators and stakeholders that are partnered with us from the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, National Jewish Hospital, Washington Department of Health, and the city of Fort Collins. Next slide, please. So our session here is called New Data and Methods Across Scales. So this got me excited and it gave me ideas for what to talk about. So the core team has um, partnered with Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and has a recent study where we wanted to understand how does smoke impact health when it's local versus when it's really several days old and has long range transport. And so this is an epidemiological study, but we had to put together exposures. And so what I'm showing here is um, NASA satellite images from a day in 2012. And this is showing the Northern Front Range where Denver and Fort Collins, Colorado is. And it's showing a fire in the mountains where the smoke was hitting us and it was only about an hour old. And then here's a different day in 2015 where there's a lot of fires in the Pacific Northwest, but then transport brought it to our study range over a few days. And so we wanted to know on a per particulate matter basis, which one had stronger health effects. And we found that the transported smoke was, was associated as expected with increased asthma hospitalizations, but local smoke was not, which was surprising to us. And what we realized is that there's more than toxicology here, there's human behaviors. And so what we hypothesize is that when smoke is local, people are really aware that there's a fire right up in the mountains, only about 20 kilometers away. And so they're, they know that what's hitting them is smoke. And so they're taking, they may be taking protective behaviors. But when smoke comes from a long ways away, it, there's been chemical reactions. It doesn't even smell like smoke anymore. So people are generally unaware. Sometimes us, the people who study smoke, don't even realize it's smoke at the time. And so there's a lot of implications here for public awareness and public health communication strategies. Next slide, please. So in order to do this, we needed to have uh, a good idea of what smoke specific PM 2.5 was. And so what we had done is we blended computer models, satellites and surface air quality monitors to come up with um, what the smoke PM 2.5 was and the non-smoke PM 2.5 was. So each of these methods uh, have strengths and limitations. So computer models tell you everything you wanna know, but they're not always right. They could put the smoke in the wrong place. The emissions might be wrong. The satellites, tell you during the daytime, you have a good view of where the smoke is, but not horizontally, but not necessarily vertically in the column. There are some satellites that can do it, but often they can't. And the, the surface monitors are great, but they're not everywhere and there can be strong gradients within smoke. So what we did is we blended the three of these and came up with a daily smoke and non-smoke PM 2.5 product from 2006 onward. So for those of you looking for, um, and this covers the whole US, it's gridded, it's available already online. So for those of you thinking about smoke, this product's already available if you would like to work with it. Next slide. So we've used this product in various health studies and, and, and uh, social outcome studies to look at cardiopulmonary health, hospital admissions, asthma specific medical care, clinical respiratory outcomes, adverse pregnancy outcomes, and even smoke versus non-smoke impacts on crimes. And it's, we're currently using this as a basic for smoke awareness and communication projects with our partners. Next slide, please. 
So our goal for this project is to expand on this project. So we, we like taking these sort of cases where things are particularly challenging, like with smoke, it may be above the surface or maybe at the surface. And just trying to think of other ways that we can apply these sort of creative mer merging of different data sources in ways that are useful for people. And so we have ideas on ozone, coarse PM and dust, ammonia, NO2, and these obviously um, have synergist, synergistic goals with a lot of other people on the health on the Haycast team. So we look forward to working with them on that as well. And that's it for me. Amy, great. Thank you, Jeff. Alex, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to present at this meeting. My name is Amy and I work with the Climate, Energy and Environment team at UNICEF headquarters. Um, my colleague Desiree from our health team is joining sessions when she can. She may be gone at the moment, but she'll be back for the breakout. And she is based on our health team. Uh, next slide, please. So 26% of deaths among children under five can be prevented by addressing environmental risks. Um, the nature of the risks is changing from poverty related to industrial related, from traditional to modern. The patterns and the burden of disease are shifting from infection diseases to NCDs. And the following two points, air pollution specific will come as no surprise to many of you, um, highlighting the sheer number of children who are exposed to polluted air and then also the inequity. The inequity in terms of, many of you may have seen that New York Times article, which I felt was a really, um, an important one on who gets to breathe clean air in New Delhi. And it, and it really showed how um, children who are living in poverty are um, bearing a disproportionate burden. All of this to say, childhood is changing. Our health program is changing according to the local burden of disease and risk factors. And in doing so has launched a global program framework on healthy environments for healthy children. And this provides evidence about the impacts of environmental hazards on children. And it calls for new partnerships across the public and private sectors and with civil society to address this challenge and to protect children's current and future well-being. Next slide. So what do we do? We're not starting from scratch. In 2020, UNICEF had 57 um, countries reporting on interventions in this whole environmental health agenda, seven of which are air pollution specific. Um, but all of these areas crossing from air pollution to childhood lead exposure to um, other environmental pollution, renewable energy solutions, safe and environmentally safe, sound waste disposal, um, promoting climate and environmental action with children and adolescents. And that's just to name a few. Of the seven countries that reported interventions and programming around air pollution, those include China, Indonesia, Mongolia, Vietnam, Kazakhstan, Madagascar and India. Um, next slide. So on what that looks like, these are the six areas of intervention on air pollution. Um, spanning from reducing air pollution and tackling the pollutants themselves to establishing multi-sectoral partnerships to address air pollution and um, community awareness, engaging health facilities, healthcare workers, schools and social media, preventing children's exposure to air pollution and improving their health so that when they are exposed, they're more resilient. Engaging young people in air quality monitoring and advocacy to reduce air pollution. We're currently um, developing a learning module for young people on air pollution that should be launched by the end of this month. Um, so, you know, resources and materials that will make a lot of these complicated topics more understandable um, for, the, for the wider public, but also for young people. And then the, the final point there on increased monitoring and use of monitoring data that many of you are developing or generating and, and, and the organizations and partnerships that you are involved in, um, which is crucial for what we are doing. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll leave you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, so we have our first question. Um, um, this one is to Jeff, but focused on whether um, a difference in chemical composition between local smoke and transported smoke uh, might influence the health outcomes in addition to the behavioral differences. Thanks for that question, Courtney. Um, yeah, that's, that's, I think, the million dollar question of, of understanding age versus local smoke. So this behavioral side, and we wanted to couple that from the chemical composition side. We have a different study where we use the data from the WeCan field campaign. So this, this is a, a campaign Emily Fisher led with aircraft data where they sampled smoke by aircraft. And what we found in that is at least for the gas-based species where we had good chemical speciation, 
the known hazardous air pollutants that the HAPs quantified by the qualified by the EPA, the concentrations of those on average go down with age. So most of those are primary pollutants, and when they react, they go away, and only a few of them are secondary pollutants. And so on average, when we look at sort of relative me metrics of how carcinogenic or how hazardous they are, that goes down with age, which is the opposite of what we found in the EPI study, where the long-range transport had bigger impacts, which is what is making us think that maybe the behavioral side is stronger. Of course, in our weekend can study, we, we didn't have detailed composition of the particle phase, so that could be um, showing the opposite of what the gas phase showed. Um, great, thank you, Jeff. Um, there's another question for Jeff in the chat, but I want to ask a question for Amy um, about from UNICEF. Um, is I was wondering, Amy, you mentioned that um, that the uh, that outreach was one of the goals of your organization and education and the use of ground-based monitors. I was wondering what you thought about the potential for different types of satellite products and for as a communication tool relevant to UNICEF's mission um, and kind of especially keeping in mind like that the satellite images of NO2 before and after COVID, those really seem to resonate. And I was just sort of curious your perspective on that. Yeah, absolutely, Tracy, and thank you for the important question. Um, I see great value. I um, will be completely honest in the fact that I am not as up to speed as I should be with all of the, the models and the data and the offering that you are providing and NASA has across its various teams. Uh, for certain, I've been working with Brian and with Emma and the, the GMAO and the composition forecast and looking at those maps and also with colleagues from Server and Maya, and I do see great opportunity. Um, I'm not there yet. I'm relying and hopeful for you know yourself and your colleagues to to help us bridge the right connections and the and the data gaps so that we can be informed as as informed as possible with our programming. Uh, thank you. That that's uh, that's helpful. And you know, I'll say I don't think anybody really knows all of the data and tools. And so I think uh, we're all learning together, and it's really um, great to have your input. Excellent. Um, since we have just one more minute, I'll just share Ira's question about uh, that Emily responded to and, and to Jeff, but um, about the research on transported smoke and health impacts, has it been published? And Emily posted in the chat, but I think actually, and Jeff reposted it to the panelists. So just a, a note that Colleen brought up earlier, but just I think the default is that what the comments that you all make go straight to the panelists, but if you, you can change it to go to everyone. And so I think that that will help too. Okay, well, this has been really a nice uh, conversation. Thank you all so much. And I think that these cross scale issues are certainly ones that we'll be keeping an eye on. I'll hand it back to um, Alex for our next session. Awesome, thank you so much, Tracy. Uh, let me start sharing my screen here and we'll all right, we're going to be pivoting over to session six now, Health Impacts Beyond Air Quality, where we're going to have actually four speakers today, Dr. Chen Xiao from University of Texas Health Center at Houston, Dr. Chris Uegio at Florida State University, and we're going to have a joint uh, Wisconsin Department of Health Services presentation by Megan Christensen and Jenny Campaneshi. Thank you all for being here today, and Dr. Zhao, we'll start with you whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. Everyone can hear me okay? Yep, we got you. Good. Um, hello, I'm very excited to be here and I'm going to talk about our work, which focuses on this highly prevalent environmental exposure and health risk factor, and that is light at night, or more precisely, artificial light at night. So as we know, it all started with electricity and lighting um, that was developed more than 100 years ago. And since then, it has quickly spread it to all over the world. So shown on this slide on the right side, you can see this beautiful image of our Earth at night, and that's taken by the Beers imaging system on one of NASA's satellites. Here you can see the United States. It's a little dark because it's at night, but it's on the top, and you can see all those little bright spots, and those are the cities. If you look closer, you may be able to identify um, larger cities such as New York City or Los Angeles, um, and of course, Houston down in the south. And according to one estimate, the intensity of light at night has increased rapidly in many urban areas over past decades, 
And nowadays, more than 99% of the US population live in areas with light polluted skies, which makes this really a big problem. Next slide, please. So, um, of course, we know that electric lighting is very beneficial. However, there are also unintended consequences. Um, there is a big energy cost associated with lighting, and there's also an ecological consequence. Uh, one of my um, favorite but sad story is that newly hatched sea turtles can be um, confused by lights coming to the cities, and therefore, instead of going to the ocean, as they are evolved to do for millions of years, they would go towards the city, which unfortunately put their life under danger. And um, more, more relevant to our study is that light at night has also become a growing public health concern. And um, it has been linked to a wide range of health problems. So we have done a number of studies looking at light at night in relation to cancer, um, to obesity, and diabetes. And we have found that in general, people living in areas with higher levels of light at night tend to have a higher risk of cancer, higher risk of developing obesity, and others work have shown links with diabetes and mental disorders as well. Um, and um, so now in the medical and public health communities, there is really this um, growing awareness and concern about the harmful effects of light at night. Um, but of course, one of the limitations here is the access to light at night data. Next slide, please. And this leads to our project. So we have formed a multidisciplinary team of epidemiologists, that's myself. And we also have a statistician, Dr. CC Bauer, um, who is also from the UT Health, um, the same institution as I am. We also have Dr. Jun Wang from University of Iowa, and he's an expert in satellite remote sensing. We have Dr. Mariana Fier um, Figuero at the Mount Sinai, and she's an expert in lighting technology and human health. We are also collaborating with Dr. Heather um, Stroh Snyder from CDC and Emily, Emily Hall from the, the Texas Department of State Health Services. And we have two primary goals for our study. The first objective is to construct annual maps of artificial light at night using images taken by current and hopefully future satellites um, from NASA. And this will allow us to identify where the hotspots are. And by hotspots, I mean um, the areas with high levels of light at night and areas that has experienced the rapid growth um, of light at night. And we will also construct map that focus on blue light, which is highly disruptive of the circadian rhythms and may lead to health problems. And next, our um, second objective is to develop visualization toolkits and um, a platform really to link the light data with the existing health data, such as those at the CDC and state health departments. And by constructing those maps and linking our data with health data, we really hope that our study will facilitate the research on light at night and its health consequences, and also to guide policy design and public health interventions that aim at reducing light at night um, in communities. And finally, I just want to mention that I believe our study has a potential to impact environmental justice as well, because light at night has been shown to be a disproportionately large problem in disadvantaged neighborhoods. So with that, I just want to say that Again, I'm very excited to be here, and I would love to hear um, from the stakeholders here today um, about what we can do to, um, to meet your demands and advance your agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, you want to take over? Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for hanging on. <coughs> Um, so you, I think you've noticed this session is about other health outcomes that um, our sort of multifaceted team can address in addition to air pollution. So extreme heat, just for background, so we're all on the same page. Uh, kills uh, classified, classified extreme heat deaths in the U.S. are about 700 per year. 
And the actual total number, so this excess number of deaths is about 10 times that, at least 10 times that. So extreme heat's a big deal in terms, and it's also um, in many respects like air pollution preventable in, in many respects. Ours is looking a little bit at a, a little finer portion of this is evaluating the urban heat island mitigation strategies for dry urinal heat exposure. Um, myself, Florida State University, uh, Lei Chu Hu, is really the brains behind a lot of the remote sensing. Uh, and so there's a wonderful team of women in STEM and policy who are also working on this project. Uh, Jenny, who will be speaking next, so I won't steal her thunder. And then uh, Daphne, New York City Mayor's Office of Resiliency. Next slide, please. So why I look at this topic specifically, essentially cities are investing billions of dollars globally in interventions to mitigate the urban heat island. And just so that we're all on the same page, um, the urban heat island, central urban areas in general, tend to be hotter and or drier than some of the surrounding uh, rural areas. And that raises their heat exposure levels, particularly their air surface temperatures and potentially human health risks. So um, that's, uh, so cities are investing billions of dollars in tree planting initiatives, cool roofs, bioswales, a variety of things that you can, you can discuss, uh, but we actually can answer some really fundamental questions. Like, uh, for example, how big of a patch of trees does one need to, to plant? So in order to uh, detectively move uh, or lower decrease uh, air temperature exposures or uh, relatedly, um, if you had, uh, $500,000, should you invest that? Do you get more bang for your buck from a health perspective and from cool roofs or from tree planting? Uh, so our team is starting to use uh, remote sensing combined with big data from somewhat similar to sort of your emerging sensor networks, but essentially from both private weather networks, uh, ground-based observations, splicing those together, uh, notably improves upon uh, the dynamic dynamicism of the urban heat island and what we can characterize and risk for human health. Next slide, please. Um, this, uh, I don't know if you could also hit the button two more times. Okay, um, and this is also getting at some of the complex trade-offs. So in a, for a straightforward policymaking audience, it's nice to say that planting trees just flat uh, across the board lowers your heat risk um, from biosphere atmospheric studies and other microclimatic studies, we know that that's um, maybe a little bit of a questionable assumption. We know that uh, there probably are a variety of processes that decrease uh, heat loading, particularly during the daytime, but there are a couple of studies and depending on where you are, where heat exposure, if you're considering uh, moisture and evaporative uh, stress, <coughs> uh, may increase heat exposures in the evening. So we're also looking at some of these trade-offs. Uh, next slide. And one more, sorry, one more. Uh, but essentially, this is some of those trade offs. And this is a preliminary results slide from uh, Lei Chu, but essentially just trying to show how, uh, in particular, one of the new NASA satellite products that we're using, EcoStress, which rides along the International Space Station, is giving us some uh, relatively high spatial resolution imagery at a higher uh, temporal resolution to really start to get at some of these dynamics and not just across day and night, but also diurnally, how that might change over the course of the day. And that's gonna be important for people who are working outside, people who are uh, sleeping and their nighttime hours at home. Uh, next slide. And that ties into a variety of health outcomes and risk factors. This is a social vulnerability map here. Just the red means those neighborhoods are more social and economically disadvantaged, but maybe not from a health perspective. So combining those together, and uh, New York City is targeting some of these interventions to these area, these neighborhoods that are in red. Um, we can try to see, uh, can we start to detect some of the health benefits from these approaches? To be uh, really honest, it's gonna be a little bit hard to do, but if, if we can't detect it in New York City, we can't detect it anywhere else. So that's sort of why we're working there. And with Wisconsin to provide another uh, comparison site um, in a different climatic zone and different demographics. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm happy to be here to um, provide a quick overview of our program. Um, Chris had mentioned um, a little bit about um, our partnership. Um, so after I speak for a couple of minutes, Megan Christensen will show you a couple of screenshots of our data portal, and that'll give you a snapshot of the kind of data that we have on our portal. 
So our program's full name is the Wisconsin Environmental Public Health Tracking Program, but we often go by Wisconsin Tracking Program for short. Um, we are located at the Department of Health Services at the state of Wisconsin. At DHS, we're a program who is located in the Bureau of Environmental and Occupational Health, and that's under the Division of Public Health. And we're funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, along with 24 other states and New York City, specifically for this tracking uh, work. We're currently in our fourth year of a five-year grant, and so we'll be applying for new competitive funding next spring. Our program has been funded since 2002, and our staff includes our section chief, who is the PI of our program, two epidemiologists, a health educator, a part-time evaluation specialist, an IT specialist, and myself, the program manager. One of the main resources from our program is our data portal. The data portal houses over 20 different environmental health related topics, each of which includes multiple measures underneath each one. And Megan is gonna show you a little bit more about our portal in a couple of minutes. Um, overall, our program also works to develop many different resources for anyone who's interested. A few of these include um, our county environmental health profiles. That is a snapshot of environmental health data for each of the 72 counties in Wisconsin. And these are done every two years. And so we'll be releasing the new profiles in the early part of the summer of this year. We also have a, a number of different outreach materials, including fact sheets and videos. We um, publish surveillance briefs, which are two to four page reports that focus on a specific environmental topic. Um, our most popular surveillance brief right now is the one on Lyme disease. We also have recorded webinars that cover different environmental topics, and we include a lot of success stories. Uh, we also have quarterly newsletters that we send out to a list of people that are interested, as well as a listserv. So ultimately, uh, the goal of our program is to compile environmental health related data from multiple sources and make it available in a number of different ways with the intent of our audiences using it to make positive public health changes in their communities. And just to give you one example of what this looks like, uh, we have a taking action with data project. And so for this project, we provide small mini grants to local and tribal health departments throughout Wisconsin um, for them to develop and implement small scale projects to improve environmental health in their communities. We'll be starting the sixth year of this project in August, and we did put the project on hold for our 2020 to 21 grant year due to the COVID response. As you can imagine, local health departments had way other uh, priorities that took place during that time. So, um, and I had mentioned the success stories earlier. You can find those on our website. Um, and a lot of those success stories that are there are examples of um, what different local and tribal health departments have done in these mini grants. So if you're interested in looking at those, that would be a place to go to look at that. Um, and that's a very quick overview of our program. And I'm gonna now turn it over to Megan and she's gonna talk a little bit more about our public data portal. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny. I'm Megan Christensen, and I'm an epidemiologist with the Wisconsin Tracking Program. Um, and I'd like to provide a quick overview of our portal and data topics with a few screenshots. Next slides, please. So this first screenshot shows the data topics that we have available on the Wisconsin Tracking Portal. Our portal has data on a variety of environmental health topics, including climate change and heat stress illness. Uh, which are relevant to this uh, grant work. So each of these topics includes several measures under it when selected. So the urban heat island data produced by the NASA grant project will be a nice complement to the other data that we provide. We'd like to add the urban heat island data to our portal. And while the urban heat island data will focus on the Madison area, uh, we hope there may be a possibility to include other urban areas of the state at some point. So many of our data topics are available at the state and county level, and we're working on adding additional topics that are available at the sub-county level. For example, our childhood lead poisoning data includes measures available at the census tract level, and we also have alcohol outlet density data at the municipality level. Next slide, please. So this screenshot shows the layout of our portal. 
So this particular example displays age adjusted rates of asthma emergency department visits. And the portal provides displays of the data in different formats, including a map, a time series graph, bar chart, and a table. And the user can toggle between these features and can also export the data in a CSV file. We've aimed to create a portal that's easy to use and understand. And our goal is for local health departments, nonprofits, academia, and other partners to use the data for outreach, programming, and policies to address community health needs. So thank you for the opportunity to collaborate. Uh, we look forward to working with you all. Thank you all. This is really, uh, really exciting to see. Um, I have a lot of questions. Uh, I don't see any coming up in the chat yet, um, but I'll ask one uh, to uh, Chin about the night, Lights at Night uh, project. And I'll, I'll just say in my community, we have a uh, regulation that all lights have to have a cover to prevent the upward. And I was wondering how common that approach is. And also if you're taking into account some of the benefits of light at night in terms of safety and crime or other things like that. Yeah, for sure. Um, both are great questions. In terms of different regulations, I think it varies a lot from place to place. One of the things that I'm actually pretty interested in studying is taking advantage of that as almost a natural experiment when there are different policies in place and some places with no policy and really to compare the impact on light itself and on light related health outcomes. So that can, you know, without um, doing a randomized trial, that's one way to get a little bit into the causality um, of those associations. And to your second, um, definitely, I think there is um, benefit to light at night in terms of public safety. Um, and also there is, you know, benefit in social interaction, which it enables. So I do think we should take those into consideration and not just looking at the bad side of it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And a question for Chris and Jenny and, and Megan, uh, it's really neat how you're going to be linking the data with this um, outreach tool. Um, is this, do you have a feeling of how it's all going to be used together for um, analysis in a different way here in Wisconsin, uh, where we're all sitting or some of us, um, versus New York? Is it like, do you see the like different outcomes or are these going to be conducted in kind of a parallel way? Maybe sure, yeah, great question. At the moment, it's, it's a, a little asymmetric. Uh, New York City has had more sort of studies on extreme heat in its area. So we're, the sort of the outcomes, health outcomes and otherwise that we're looking at are trying to complement with that literature versus reproduce it. Um, and yeah, so I think, uh, and then we could try to do something somewhat similar for Wisconsin, but scale back a bit. Okay. Um, and I can just add one small detail to that is that we do have the ability on our portal to have two different topics side by side um, to, to kind of compare. Um, but we put that information up with the caveat that um, and the messaging really to, to people that are looking at that, that you cannot look at these two things and instantly make a, a decision or a correlation without detailing, you know, digging into the data more. Um, but that is an option if if folks want to look at two maps side by side at some point. So uh, that's great. Thank you so much. Well, we're out of time. I have a question I'm going to post in the in the chat for for you guys, but I'm going to hand it back to Alex to take us into our final breakout session. Awesome. I'm not breakout Thanks. session session. Oh yeah, <laughs> breakout rooms are coming right after this session. So here, let me uh, start sharing the screen here. All right, we're going to go to our final session, session seven, supporting air quality management, where we have three speakers today. Dr. Arlene Fiore from the Lamont Doherty, uh, from Columbia University, uh, Dr. Ted Russell from Georgia Tech, and finally, Dr. Baron Henderson from the EPA. Arlene, whenever you're ready, uh, we'll get started with you. Sure, let's go ahead. Thanks. Um, so our project sits at the intersection of air quality, health, and climate, and our focus region is the Northeast US. Um, so with this slide, I wanted to introduce our fairly large team. So I'd ask you to scan the photos and read the names. 
Um, and our goal here is to, sort of an overarching goal, is to address a common need for spatiotemporal data sets of pollutant distributions. And this really emerged from discussions with our different stakeholder partners who are shown here in the middle row. And in addition, the stakeholders who I've highlighted in blue are part of our advisory panel who will help us prioritize along the way. Um, in the bottom row, um, we're grateful to have involvement from several scientific collaborators who bring a wealth of expertise on different satellite products, as well as in public health. Um, next slide, please, Alex. Okay, so with our project, we have three main thrusts, and um, each is motivated by questions from our stakeholder partners. Um, and so those questions are shown at the top of the slide for, for this first objective. Um, and here, we're leveraging a nationwide study led by um, Koai Mariantiana Kimortsoglu, who's an epidemiologist at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia. Um, in that project, she's constructing highly resolved ensemble means and uncertainty ranges for pollutant distributions um, that basically her, her um, model ingests various Earth observation data sets and air quality models uh, with some examples uh, shown here. And with our, for our HACAS project, uh, Marianthi and our team will be optimizing these products for the Northeast US and investigating how pollutant exposure and importantly their uncertainties vary among pollutants and also with emissions meteorology. And we're delighted to have Koai Susanna Adamo at the Center for International Earth Science Information Network, or CSIN, which actually sits at the on the same campus as Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, where my group is at Columbia. Um, and so with her, we'll be looking at social vulnerability indicators as well. We also have uh, Koai Tabas of INSAF at New York, New York State Department of Health, and she'll be facilitating incorporation of exposure data sets into their public health surveillance system. So I think some similarities with uh, maybe uh, what, what we saw in the last talk at Wisconsin. All right, next slide, please. Great, so our second objective here, um, our goal is to dig a little bit deeper into the factors driving ozone formation in New York City and downwind, because ozone remains a really challenging air quality pro problem for this region. And this, the, our, the, our HACAST project will expand upon some prior work in my group that it has been testing the information content of satellite products of tropospheric formaldehyde and nitrogen dioxide as indicators for ozone formation chemistry. And we'll be working closely with Alex Karambelis of NESCOM and Ruby Tian of uh, New York State DEC to assist in analyzing observations from the summer 2018 field campaign that took place over Long Island Sound. Um, and so our initial effort here uh, investigates ozone sensitivity to nitrogen oxides and VOCs during high ozone events. And so I have a figure on the slide just showing preliminary work by my current student, Madang Kui Tao, that suggests that the aerial extent of ozone formation sensitivity to NOx um, increases on the highest ozone days. And so we're interested to uh, probe this deeper and uh, understand how our conclusions may evolve with emission controls and climate. So next slide, please. Okay, and this final objective kind of continues on the theme of trends, but really expands into the health realm, realm even more so. Um, and this builds on prior work that quantified health burden changes over New York State, and um, it expands on it by going to finer spatial scales, uh, more pollutants, and bringing in heat, um, as well as uh, social vulnerability and different demographic data sets. And so here, Koai Tabasam Insaf at uh, New York State Department of Health uh, will be using the exposure data sets generated under our first objective to conduct in-house epidemiologic analyses at the New York State Department of Health that enables linking directly to fine scale health records. And then um, these exposure response relationships that come out um, will be applied to examine recent as well as near term uh, future trends across the region. And uh, with, with Susanna Adamo, uh, our COI, these analyses will also incorporate uh, demographic and socioeconomic data sets. And so we're hoping the information we glean with our study will improve our understanding of exposure and health burdens um, in environmental justice regions, as well as the uncertainties and the factors that contribute to those uncertainties with the ultimate goal of informing public health and air quality decision making. All right, thank you. Oh, right, so I pass on to uh, Todd Russell. Thanks so much, Arlene. And 
It's great to see all the projects that people are doing as part of this round of Haycast. And I'm uh, happy to talk to you about uh, a project that hopefully you'll be excited as, as we are we, that we call Planes, Boats, and Trains, and Satellites. And what this is focused on is to look at the air quality and health impacts of ports. And by ports, we're talking about airports, seaports, rail yard uh, emissions, and how they impact local and global uh, air quality and health. And the focus on ports really is, is that as many of the other sources of air pollution go down, port emissions are not gonna be going down uh, as much necessarily. And in fact, just one of our recent uh, studies found that in Los Angeles, when we look at 2030, NO2 levels are going down everywhere, except at least um, predicted to go down everywhere, except right next to the airports, where you can actually see potential increases in NO2, just because of the increased activities of airports. The other thing that's very interesting about ports is that often that they're surrounded by lower income communities. And if you look at the upper right hand picture, that's the uh, Atlanta airport. And about a third of that, including some of the concourses are in a town called College Park that is about 80% um, uh, black and it's lower socioeconomic uh, status community. The Rail, rail yard on the uh, left is surrounded by uh, lower SES um, communities. And the same is true with Savannah. And you see this actually across the country is that ports are often surrounded by lower income um, communities. So not only the emissions potentially increasing, there are also vulnerable communities associated with them. So next slide, please. What our plan of attack is, is to really utilize the range of Earth science products, satellites, airborne observations when they're available, air quality models, as we'll talk about in a sec, and ground-based monitoring, including low-cost sensors, um, to really understand what the potential air quality impacts and health impacts are. And the team that's listed there uh, from Georgia Tech, there's Talat Odman, who's familiar to many of you who have been in Haycast and Acast before. Jen Kaiser, who is a new professor uh, doing atmospheric chemistry work, Young Tao and myself. Uh, CDC is Rish uh, Vyadnathan, who is uh, an air quality and health scientist. And then what's important is we also have a number of participants from local state um, and national air quality uh, health and health agencies. Jim Boylan from Georgia, saying me Lee from the South Coast, which is Los Angeles. Donna Kensky uh, initially participated. Many of you may know that she is retired. So Zach Edelman from LADCO. Allison Patton from Health from HEI, the Health Effects Institute, Paul Miller, and Cassandra johnson Gaylor from uh, US Forest Service. And then importantly, um, we've included one and maybe even two schools uh, to be associated with us, and in particular, uh, assist in low cost, low cost monitoring. John Faison is from the Woodward uh, School, which is in College Park, right at the end of the runways of the um, uh, Atlanta airport. So next slide, please. And just to give you an example of what we're doing and what we plan to uh, continue at other locations is that this is a study that we've been doing. It's been led by a grad student, uh, Abby Lawal, uh, looking at the Atlanta airport. And Atlanta airport used to be the busiest airport in the world. And when you looked at a satellite image of the Atlanta area, you really saw these three um, high NOx areas, high NO2 areas, high NO2 column areas. And two of them were power plants. And then the third, this red blob that was right at the south part of, of Atlanta uh, is right at the Atlanta airport. So we've been using Tropomi and CMAC and uh, ground-based monitoring to assess the uh, the air quality impacts of the Atlanta airport. And just to give you an idea, and first we compared the two and utilized uh, the CMAC results in looking at Tropomi. And then what we're doing now is we're using the CMAC results to assess the impact 
of the um, airborne emissions on ozone PM 2.5 ultrafine particles, which is if you look to the right, there's a, a CMAC field of ultrafine particles um, and the air quality health impacts on vulnerable communities. All just focusing on the impact of these, uh, these ports. And just as an example of other ports, if you go to the next slide, uh, one that we looked at was um, Savannah. Problem was then we didn't have the same type of uh, satellite sensing uh, results that we do now with with Tropomi, and certainly that we will that we're looking forward to getting the Tempo and Maya uh, products as well, so we can do even more in-depth study of these ports. And it's really the uh, the shift to having these much higher resolution products is going to make it um, make the ability to use those those types of data uh, for these health studies uh, much more much more precise and detailed. And then on the lower one, it was looking at the uh, air quality impacts of a rail yard. So with that, you know, we're really looking forward to going forward and using the various products that are now becoming available and looking at other locations throughout the US. Thank you. And I guess I'll pass it on to Baron. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'm going to be a little bit different here in, in two ways. One, I'm not going to use slides. And the other one is I'm really going to be talking about this from a, a stakeholder perspective. So I'm really excited to be here and thrilled to be a stakeholder on several of the base projects that, uh, that has HeyCast moving forward. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the Tiger teams where, of course, so much of the progress is made. I'm going to use my time to highlight successes from the last Haycast round from a stakeholder perspective and then highlight some needs that I see for, for our agency and for air quality management. Um, one of the reasons that I'm so excited to be part of these base projects and the Tiger project going forward is because of the strongly proven success from the last round. There were too many projects to highlight the successes of all of them, but of course there were amazing projects highlighting the air quality progress that has been made, which is an important part of air quality management. That is telling the success stories that can be seen from space. Um, so that was a wonderful, uh, successful project. There were also project producing databases of modeling that are necessary for air quality management projects. There were projects where we use satellite data to evaluate the models that support air quality modeling decisions. Um, and in particular, I, I like to highlight um, one of the projects that I see as having benefited our agency and, and highlight why it benefited us so much so that you all can think about how to integrate those types of successes into your project. Um, the assimilation project that was led by Brad Pierce and Daniel Tong was a, a very special project from my perspective because there was a very strong direct technology transfer to our agency. So they went out and showed that they could uh, do something. They built a, a framework for applying it. And then they also delivered that framework to us. That was extremely helpful because we could then apply that in different ways. It motivated the creation of a fellow position at the EPA to apply data assimilation within the modeling frameworks that we use at the EPA. Um, and it also led to a webinar where we reached out to the agency more broadly than ACAS to try to get input on how we should go forward with data assimilation. So you can see that the, the project itself had the immediate success, but then the technology transfer to the stakeholder agency helped to us bloom in terms of our capacity for data assimilation and also helped us reach out beyond the community that we have traditionally worked with uh, from a data assimilation standpoint. Um, and so that was huge. So as a stakeholder, I see this as uh, an amazing super success. And um, hopefully each one of these projects will find a way to transfer a piece of the technology that they're working with to their stakeholders. Um, one of the projects that I should have mentioned that, that has that effect is um, the 
project where they created cookbooks. I think Arlene was the lead of that project, cookbooks for applying satellite to air quality management decisions. Those types of things have very tangible benefits. So it's not just that it can be done. It's not just someone did that. It's I can do that. And I think that's uh, a wonderful success. So of course, uh, there's still so much to do. Uh, when we apply satellites, we have the benefit now of having finer and finer resolution, more and more temporal resolution. All of those things are gonna help us break a barrier that we have struggled with historically. Satellite data has often been able to tell us what is at a particular site, but that site may be so broad as to make it difficult to separate out different types of, of sectors. As we get finer temporal resolution and spatial resolution, we can start to ask some of the questions that are critical to air quality management. Not just what was the concentration, but perhaps who did it come from? Is that a controllable source? Is it a non-controllable source? What we want is not just to be able to look somewhere and say what is, but to say what can be. And that's the air quality management struggle is not just what is, but to figure out how to make it even better to improve the health outcomes in the population at large, and also to try to decrease the environmental justice disparities that we know exist. Um, so as we move forward, we really wanna to try to disentangle the satellite measurement and the sectors that, that cause it. And one of the things that I just wanted to highlight too is as we use satellites, we often inform those through uh, models and we inform those through statistical models as well as dynamical models. And when we do so, we sometimes can create artificial gradients at fine scales. Those are gradients that are in our statistical models or in our dynamical models that may or may not actually exist on the ground. And this is a very challenging area because when we do that, the statistical performance of the model depends on observations that are sparse. And the gradients that we're creating have implications for environmental justice. So I really look forward to in this round as we're applying machine learning, as we're applying data fusion, as we're applying all sorts of different tools in the context of satellites, making sure that we're cognizant of how the gradients that we've created either enhance the environmental justice that we're able to see or potentially create environmental justice issues that may not exist. We have to be very careful uh, of those types of things. Um, so again, as a, as a stakeholder, I'm thrilled to see all the projects that are moving forward and I'm excited to be, uh, to play my role in them. Thanks a bunch. Thank you, uh, Baron, and thanks to everybody for um, these great uh, talks wrapping up uh, the, the session today. Um, I wanted to share a few questions from the um, chat. Um, uh, Ana Prados had asked about Arlene's work with uh, PM 2.5, and I'm wondering, Arlene, could you answer that one quickly? Sure. Um, so yeah, actually I had replied in the chat, but basically it's using, uh, so I should mention this is an ongoing project in development. So the methods they're published, but we don't yet have products. Um, and and Marianthi's approach is to take existing products out there, many of which have been used in health studies that you, for instance, like satellite derived PM 2.5 products, but merge those with the ground-based data as well as models to develop an ensemble where you can say, here's an ensemble mean of exposure based on the different products that are out there. And this is the range of the products out there. Thank you, uh, Arlene. And Doug had a question for Ted um, about were satellite and CMAC model comparisons used to evaluate the emission inventories and or the models? I think that's actually getting at a very, very common uh, question so uh, that comes up. So Ted, go ahead. We actually uh, we actually used it to um, primarily evaluate the emission inventory. For one, because it's it's an NO2 column, uh, 
And so you're looking specifically at how well you, you get that, uh, the primary emission of NOx. So at this point, it was, it was really focused on the emission inventory. I will say um, one of the things that was great about this is we had those two power plants. And if you recall, power plants have continuous emission monitors. So we could compare the satellite OBS, um, the satellite retrievals for the two power plants, which were really, really spot on, I will say. Um, and then use that sort of as a calibration. And then we use the, um, the satellite to evaluate the NOx emissions from the, uh, from the airport, which was remarkably, I mean, not nearly so spot on as the, uh, the power plants, but was not as far off as we might have feared. Thanks, Ted. And um, Baron, your your comment about the cookbooks has been getting a lot of interest in the chat and there's a lot of uh, links that have been shared. So that's great. Um, I think, you know, we are now at the time that we're going into the breakout sessions. Um, I posted those in the chat. They are also all linked through our meeting uh, website, which I've also been posting in the chat and maybe Alex can post it there and some right as I'm wrapping up here. Um, but you know, I just want to thank everybody for taking time today to uh, be part of this meeting. I'd like to thank Alex Pavlik for jumping in and making this meeting a real success. I'd like to thank NASA for supporting this uh, initiative, um, continuing to support the HayCast initiative. It's really exciting. And as I've been posting in the chat, we have a Google Doc evolving to, you know, hear your thoughts. So even though the meeting is ending, your involvement in HayCast, I hope, is just beginning. We have a newsletter mailing list. We have a Twitter feed. We have a lot of different ways to engage with different communities. So I hope you'll stay um, engaged with us. And uh, with that, I will say goodbye and see you in breakout session number one with um, Brian Duncan and hopefully Catherine Pruitt. And um, I hope that uh, you all have good discussions and uh, look forward to hearing back from the HeyCast hosts on what was discussed. So um, one last thing is that uh, the breakout sessions will be recorded, but those are just for our internal notes. Those will not be posted anywhere. So feel free to have frank discussions of whatever you want. Um, okay, thanks everybody. Um, hope to talk to you again soon.